Good morning, everybody from the Netherlands, and uh, good afternoon for people uh, in Indonesia. I should stay here, I guess, for the camera. <laughs> we are delighted to welcome you all in uh, today's uh, workshop uh, and event. Uh, welcome in the in the Na Indonesia and the Netherlands uh, Technology Partnership uh, Forum, two thousand twenty-two. Uh, this year, the topic will be towards uh, hydrogen economy, lessons from the Netherlands. Uh, today, we're offline and live stream from beautiful city of Groningen in the north of the Netherlands, uh, a very beautiful uh, venue and building uh, today. So thanks for the University of Groningen. Uh, today's workshop is part of the multi-year collaborative project uh, between Bandung Institute of Technology alumni I, a Netherlands chapters with the Embassy of Indonesia for the Netherlands in The Hague. Uh, and this year, INTPF uh, 2022 is fully supported by uh, ECADIN, Energy Academy Indonesia, and specially organized with University of Groningen and Groningen Seaport uh, for tomorrow's site visit. A very welcome to all of you. Really appreciate your time in your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Intan Ambari, Senior Process Technologist at Shell Amsterdam. So today I will be uh, the Master of Ceremony. Uh, it's really an honor for me to introduce uh, and welcome our guests today. Uh, there are also people who uh, have traveled a long way from Indonesia to be here with us today. So uh, welcome the ambassador of the Republic Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Good morning to His Excellency Bapak Mayer Fass. Good morning, Bapak Mayer Fass. Good morning to Bapak Hageng Nugroho, uh, Senior Advisor at, ex at Executive Office of the President of the Republic Indonesia. Good morning, Pak Hageng. Good morning to uh, Bapak Midian Samosir. Good morning, Pak uh, Vice President, Senior Vice President, Corporate Banking, uh, uh, Bank Mandiri. And then good morning, Bapak Glanusta Ramadan. Good morning, Pak. Uh, also travel far away from uh, Indonesia, the Vice President of Energy Sector, uh, Bank Mandiri. We wish you all a very welcome also to all the speakers and all participants in today's event. We are very glad to hold this event here, uh, again in the, in the University of Groningen, where we can later this morning, we'll visit the, the Zernika Laboratory. So that will be a, a really a, a nice uh, for us here in, in, in Groningen to visit. Unfortunately for people in Indonesia, you, you cannot join us uh, visiting the laboratory later, uh, but, I'm sure uh, we will share all the information and the learnings later uh, offline. On the screen, I'm not sure if we can see the rundown of the program for today. It will be a, a, a full packed program. So uh, we will uh, split it into two um, sessions in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if the rundown will be shown or... Yes, yeah, so it will be a, a, a full pack uh, a program in the morning. There will be two keynote uh, uh, speeches, uh, one uh, from Indonesia, uh, from Papa Hagen, and then uh, later Carla will also uh, give a, a keynote speech in the morning session uh, uh, and then followed by the discussion. And then we will have a, a short break, a coffee break, and then uh, next, after the break, we will have uh, uh, three different uh, speakers who will give us also uh, uh, some insight into the hydrogen uh, economy. And then uh, we will uh, end up the morning session with a with, uh, with lab tour and, of course, uh, lunch in this building. Uh, hope this event will, further, uh, will trigger further sharing and collaborations between Indonesia and the Netherlands, and that will be mutually beneficial for both countries. Uh, without further ado, to open our event today, I would like to invite uh, the INTPF 2022 chairman, uh, Ms. Testi Alfano, to deliver her opening remarks. Uh, please, Ms. Testi, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Ini yang di satu, satu, satu jangkal di bawah. Kembali ke Good morning and good afternoon as well for those who join this uh, event, this uh, program from Indonesia as well as from India. So we do have also participants from India as well. In fact, it's not participants, but then our speaker. <laughs> so uh, yeah, distinguished ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Bapak, His Excellency Bapak Mayerfas, distinguished uh, senior advisor at Executive Office of the President of the Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Hagen Nugroho, distinguished senior policy advisor, hydrogen team at the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, uh, Mrs. Carla Rupledo, and distinguished invited speakers, distinguished invited participants, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the work, uh, workshop entitled Hydrogen Towards Hydrogen Economy Lessons from the Netherlands, where, yeah, as mentioned before, uh, this program is organized by the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the, Re the uh, Netherlands in collaboration with the Bandung Institute of Technology Alumni Network Netherlands chapter in collaboration as well with Energy Academy Indonesia or ECADIN. As you may know as well, and yeah, it's globally known, that the Netherlands has an excellent progress in establishing national hydrogen backbone, particularly in the northern Netherlands. Here, hydrogen become yeah has become crucial and is a key for the country to moving forward as well as fighting the climate change at the same time. And well, yeah, here many hydrogen uh, projects are already under development. Uh, including the constructions of electrolyzers and uh, hydrogen uh, plant, specific port uh, facilities, as well as the use of hydrogen in many industries, including uh, yeah, uh, heating uh, industries as well as uh, mobility sectors. And today in this uh, event, we will learn from policy makers, from uh, industries, as well as from uh, researchers uh, on how the journey behind the national hydrogen backbone here in the Netherlands, uh, making them being one of the biggest or largest hydrogen producer in the world with a significant boost for industrial hydrogen ecosystem. And we believe these best practices can help Indonesia to create fast moving research as well as partnership in hydrogen development, ranging in, uh, yeah, from production, transport, to use in industries, mobility, as well as uh, buildings. So uh, yeah, I and the event uh, committees are truthfully delighted again, as uh, our host mentioned before, and honored to be able to facilitate this program today. And uh, yeah, in fact, the today's event is our first day uh, program of the whole program we do have uh, with the Indonesian uh, delegates. Uh, tomorrow we will have a site visit to Running and Seaports M Southend for having a discussion on realizing the hydrogen opportunities, moving from pilots and demos to maturing and scaling up the hydrogen ecosystem. So we truly, for sure, we truly hope this initiative will open many more uh, windows of collaboration, opportunities between Indonesia and the Netherlands in achieving more sustainable future. So to conclude uh, my a opening remark, I would like to say thank you to all organizing committees today for your great efforts so that this uh, event may happen today. I would also like to say thank you to all collaborating as well as uh, supporting partners, invited speakers, invited uh, uh, participants coming from Indonesia to join us today here in Groningen. Uh, and last but not least, uh, our online participants joining us today, 
uh, on Zoom as well as YouTube, Eka Dean. Thank you. And as in Dutch, we say, Sengit Ervan. I should say so. Sengit Ervan. So enjoy the sharing program today. Thank you. Next in the, in the agenda, it's an honor to have His Excellency uh, Mr. Mayerfas, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, joining us virtually to deliver his opening speech. Please, Excellency Bapak Mayerfas, the screen is yours. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning. Selamat pagi dari. Uh, 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 for you in the Netherlands, selamat sore Bapak Ibu di di Indonesia atau di 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 mana uh, di luar Belanda. Uh, yang terhormat Bapak Hug Hageng Nugroho, Senior Advisor at the Executive Office of the President of the Republic of Indonesia, welcome to Netherlands, Pak Groningen. Uh, Carla Robledo, Senior Policy Advisor uh, Hydrogen Team at the Ministry of Economics, Affairs, and Climate Policy. Ibu Desi Alcano, INPPF Chairman, Chairperson. Uh, Bapak Raymond v. Frediansyah, Chairman of IAITB, Nadelan Chapter. Distinguished speakers and participants from Indonesia and the Netherlands, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm honored to speak in front of distinguished expert in hydro, uh, hydrogen ecosystem. The aim of our uh, 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 workshop is intent to tap the Netherlands experience and expertise in the developing its hydrogen ecosystem. The fact that the Netherlands is currently the second largest producer in the world, it is officially a testament to its success, hydrogen research and development. The experience and expertise, expertise of the Netherlands would provide significant value for Indonesia in developing its own hydrogen ecosystem. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Bapak Ibu, yang kami hormati. It has been widely known that there is expected to be sevenfold rise in hydrogen demand by two. 2050, about 660 million ton a year will be needed to decarbonize power, industry and transport and store excess renewable electricity. The majority of hydrogen today is produced using fossil fuel, but there is now a wide range of carbon-free and low-carbon production method for hydrogen, among others, the green hydrogen, which is produced by electrolysis power by renewable energy sources to split water molecules into their constituent, constituent part, namely hydrogen and oxygen. In the battle against climate change, any technology that might play a vital role over the next 20 or 30 years should be taken into strong consideration, particularly for policy makers. Needless to say, this underlines the importance to develop the green hydrogen ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia believes that hydrogen is one of the main ways to support our energy, green energy transition. It needs to be scaled up to a more ambitious climate action and sustainable future. Indonesia will need an investment of up to 25 billion 
US dollar to develop green hydrogen from 2031 to 2060. Green hydrogen will become alternative energy for the transportation, industrial and household sector with ma with mass adoption by 2050. With this such uh, ambition, we definitely need strong support and learn from each other, including from all of you, the expert. With your in-depth expertise and experience, we hope that cooperation in hydrogen and renewable energy in general can be extended further to achieve both countries' climate and green energy ambitions. Today's meeting is our opportunity to have a constructive discussion about the hydrogen support system. I believe that we will learn a lot from each other today and contribute to the energy transition as one of the pillars of Indonesia G20 presidency and to further achieve our common recover together and recover stronger. I wish you a fruitful and productive workshop. Thank you. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Excellency Bapak Mayer Fass, for the opening uh, speech. Uh, the next in the agenda is a keynote uh, speech from our guest speakers. Uh, before that, uh, let me hand over the session to our morning moderator and facilitator. Uh, please a warm welcome to Professor ja Bayu Jayawardana. Professor Bayu is the Director of Mechanical Engineering Master Program, University of Groningen. Please, uh, Mr. Bayu, the floor is yours. Thank you for the, the introductions. Uh, good morning, everyone. As a representative of uh, University of Groningen, as well as the uh, board chairman of one of the institutes within the faculty, uh, the, the Institute of Engineering Technology Institute of Groningen, I'd like to welcome all the delegates as well as uh, people online who are uh, present today and would like to know what is this uh, session all about. We are going to learn a bit on the interaction between the Indonesia and Netherlands, and we know that uh, there has been a visit by the King uh, Willem Alexander to Indonesia together with the Prime Minister to establish the strong relation between Indonesia and Netherlands, particular on the energy transitions agenda. And I'm proud to say that Groningen has played an important role in this aspect because Groningen is an area of the energy valley already since the 70s with the, uh, uh, the, the finding of the gas uh, natural resources. And now it tries to transition itself towards the hydrogen economy. And we are actually part of these uh, transitions as a university where we conduct research and educations where we try to prepare the uh, future generations for the incoming energy transitions. Now, uh, today we have a number of uh, speakers. And uh, for the first sessions, I would like to welcome Pa Hagen Nugroho who is the Senior Energy Advisor on the Strategic Issues at the Executive Office of the President of Indonesia. He has uh, taken various roles as well within the same office already since 2017. And uh, today he is going to tell us more about the uh, plan or the policy with regards to the hydrogen economy in Indonesia. So I'd like to welcome uh, Pa Hagen Nugroho to on stage. Pa Hagen. Is it okay? Right. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Selamat pagi. Selamat siang yang ada di Indonesia. Pertama, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you. This is a very honorable moment, opportunity for us here. Uh, speaking in, from Groningen, Groningen University, one of the biggest campus in Netherlands. Um, I would like just to speak up a bit about a uh, um, little bit about policy, a little bit about the message from the presidents, and a little bit about 
how our uh, future energy policy. But I'm not going into the detail today. First, uh, let me uh, say thank you for the introduction, Professor Bayou. Uh, and then I would also um, uh, say thank you to the University of Groningen. Uh, INTPF is the host and the, uh, the His Excellency Ambassador of, of Indonesia for the King of Nether Netherlands, His Excellency Mr. Meyer Fass. Is it correct? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, Today, um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning in this workshop. The title is Toward Hydrogen Economy, Lesson Learned from Netherlands. And first and foremost, let me express my gratitude uh, to everyone here uh, in the Groningen University. I can say that this is the first opportunity for us from the president office standing in any in the world. I mean, we haven't had any international exposure speaking about the hydrogen. So this is the first one. So I, I would say that this is a good moment for us. As you may aware, the, the scale of economic of Indonesia is growing fast and uh, the predictable it is predicted in the next coming years that would be one of the six country the biggest economy of GDP in the world. So, being that that the, I think uh, Indonesian demands of energy is also growing over its time. Mm -hmm. So once we also uh, understood understand that the the, the global uh, dynamic of the economic energy sector is very uh, very dynamic and very depends on the fossil fuel so that I think in the next coming year we we are urgently need to seek for another alternative energy one of them is hydrogen as well through this event I believe uh, we can uh, share the idea exchange ideas and we can exercise every possibility that could be better for our uh, next generation. Indonesia is one of the rich country, resource-wise. Uh, based on our research, we are, uh, have five raw, five raw materials from uh, that can be processed to hydrogen. Uh, one of them is uh, cocoa bean cells, uh, substance of containing sugar, palm oil, milk, effluent, sago, and algae. So we are rich on this resource. So in the future, I think based on that, we are confident. Yeah, we have comparative advantage, but in the future, we may just need to increase the competitive age. <clears throat> based uh, on that as well, we are probably look at what are the the opportunity in in domestic market and also international market so this is hydrogen for us is also not only for the resource of the energy but also the resource of economic as a commodity in the future uh, ladies and gentlemen i would say that um the Groningen University, I think this is one of the leading campus that has a hydrogen research. And we are very uh, happy that if there in the future, we may have a good cooperation and we ha have a technology transition and technology transfers from the Netherlands to Indonesia as well in terms of produce uh, the, or process to, of hydrogen. I believe I am well, and also that the the Netherlands, the King of Netherlands, has also taken a big step to reduce emission. Uh, that's why the electricity and also the uh, uh, the hydrogen research are uh, now being one of the uh, uh, the advantage uh, in the Netherlands. 
we will give i think those are we will give us reference um we may have a chance to discuss and we may make some plan together ahead and also mutual benefit relationship between indonesia and the netherlands and i hope the effort to suppress the emission will be uh, profitable for the next generations last i would strengthen the message from the president uh, to foster the solidarity collaboration through the global collective leadership and consistently oversee the implementation of uh, reducing carbon on every country. That's all from us. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pa Hagen, for uh, the uh, support from the uh, Republic of Indonesia towards the energy transitions. And I'm uh, glad to hear as well that the uh, hydrogen uh, will become part of the uh, energy portfolio in Indonesia in the coming years. Uh, and I think this is a nice transition to the next speaker who will be uh, given by uh, Carla Robledo, uh, who, who is currently a senior policy advisor at the Directorate General Climate and Energy and Hydrogen Team of the Netherlands. And I think without any further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Carla to present uh, the plan of the Netherlands. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, wonderful invitation uh, to be here. Uh, sorry, I cannot be there physically at the moment, uh, but glad to join online and to tell a bit about uh, what we're doing in the Netherlands, uh, what have been doing the last years, and where do we want to go in the coming years. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so yes, I'm Carla Robredo, working at the ministry, and I have been involved in the development of the hydrogen strategy and since then in the implementation. But let me tell you a bit about the drivers that we have in the Netherlands and why do we need hydrogen? Some of them were already briefly mentioned, so thanks for that. Um, but I think it's important to understand that we actually have a large uh, amount of gray hydrogen produced, hydrogen produced from fossil fuels being implemented in the industry as a feedstock, especially for ammonia production, for methanol, for also in the refinery. Uh, and actually, this gives an, like, um, a great opportunity to um, make this more clean hydrogen. So we already have uh, applications for hydrogen, but we also want to develop new applications in mobility, also for dispatchable power. There are some pilots in the residential area. So we see a large role for existing hydrogen production to make that more clean, but also to develop new applications where uh, hydrogen will be needed uh, and not those are really hard to decarbonize without hydrogen. As well, there's a large potential for offshore wind at the North Sea. So we actually have uh, an increase uh, recently, was increased the target to around 20 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, in 2030, and now the ambition to have 70 gigawatts in 2050. These are a large amount of electricity being produced offshore which cannot be all brought to, to land in, uh, with cables. So we need a combination of hydrogen and electricity production offshore to bring all this energy um, to the mainland. Uh, and then one of the also very important uh, drivers is, um, of course, the shutting down of the gas production in Groningen. This is already in, in two years' time, the, the production will be brought down to zero uh, BCMs. Uh, and then we will have, um, here you see on the left side, the yellow lines and the black lines. Those are all pipelines that are already in place for natural gas transport. So if you see, there are parallel pipelines because we have the low calorific gas, which is the gas coming from Groningen. And we also have the high calorific um, gas uh, pipelines, which is mainly used in the rest of Europe. So actually, the pipelines that are connected to Groningen will be available shortly, uh, and we can dedicate it fully for hydrogen. I will tell a bit more about our plans to do this. Um, and we also have uh, a lot of knowledge associated to gas, which we can uh, use uh, for developing the hydrogen infrastructure. And we have a large potential in the northern Netherlands to develop large-scale underground hydrogen storage because we have the salt deposits where salt cameras can be made. So these are the main drivers, why we think uh, hydrogen will be uh, crucial in the energy system here in the Netherlands. 
Next slide, please. Yes. So, um, well, hydrogen, um, it has been a long time around, but uh, it really started to play a role in the Netherlands in uh, 2019, where it was for the first time uh, mentioned in the climate agreement and really um, in, in different sectors of the, of, of the economy and hydrogen was a recurring theme. It was coming up a lot. Um, and here for the first time in the climate agreement, it was agreed to reduce around um, 49 percent of the CO2 emissions uh, um, by 2030. This has already been increased and now with a new um, coalition agreement to almost 60 percent. Um, and there we have the first emissions for hydrogen in place to have three to four gigawatts of electrolysis of hydrogen production by 2030 in the Netherlands. The next step in our strategy was to develop a specifically hydrogen strategy from the government where we recognize the systemic role that hydrogen plays in a uh, renewable and clean energy system. Um, so the system integration part is very important, really needed for the whole uh, chain of energy supply. Um, and in 2020, in March, we published the, this strategy. You can find it online. There's also an English version. Um, and we set it uh, a, a really a clear policy agenda focusing on upscaling hydrogen production and use uh, and also on the cost reduction, how to achieve this uh, until 2030. Since then, we have been uh, imp implementing this strategy. Um, and what we have achieved is to uh, have more funding for innovation and for scaling up of electrolyzers. As well, I will tell a bit more about the transport infrastructure development plan that uh, has been recently published to have this hydrogen backbone, this transport net uh, on a national level. Um, and also we have been very active on the international cooperation and establishing international supply chains because we will also need imports. Even if we have domestic production, we foresee that this will not be enough to cover our hydrogen demands. So our Dutch strategy is based on three pillars. We have the supply where we focus on both production and imports and the very strong pillar on infrastructure, developing the infrastructure to break that chicken and egg problem where there are uh, people that want to use hydrogen uh, end users, but there's no infrastructure. So there we want to solve that problem uh, and a strong pillar on the international cooperation. Next slide, please. I'll tell a bit more now about the supply part and the, uh, what have been doing um, now regarding production, but where do we want to head in the coming years as well? So if you look at the first, uh, uh, where we are now in 2022, we are setting up um, an instrument, a subsidy instrument with 250 million euros for relatively small electrolyzers so they're already large but they're the first safe uh, the first phase in scaling up up to 50 megawatts uh, as well uh, via um, the IPSE uh, that is the um, important projects of common European interest that's a European instrument where national uh, governments put their own subsidy we have reserved 800 millions for production uh, of green hydrogen so the projects that are lined up uh, count to more than one gigawatt if all these projects are to be achieved we will definitely reach our goal in 2025 of having 500 megawatts um, operational the next phase is uh, implementing the national growth fund project and this, is, uh, this has been awarded around 800 mi uh, million euros to achieve the also the next phase in scaling up around 200 to 300 megawatts and focusing on research, innovation, on the human capital agenda, developing uh, this, um, which is also needed for scaling up hydrogen uh, implementation in the Netherlands. As well, um, we have announced extra 11 gigawatts, accounting to 20 uh, gigawatts of wind offshore. And now we're looking into developing the first 
pilots before 2030 already with offshore hydrogen production. So we see that already before 2030, we can have the first experiences so that uh, after that we can uh, scale up further. Then looking into the second half of uh, this decennium, uh, we are going to be shifting not so much on the production side, uh, but also taking into a, uh, account how we can stimulate the demand side. Um, we need uptakes of clean hydrogen for this. We need to stimulate it. The European uh, Commission is also uh, looking into obligations for green hydrogen in the industry. So we need to find the right balance between the, the at this moment we need to uh, stimulate production, but at some time we will need to shift to actually have the uptake. That is where we are heading. And of, of course, as well, uh, at, at the end of this uh, decennium, we want to have connection to an, a national and an international hydrogen infrastructure where we see a European backbone being involved in, uh, and having the connections with our neighboring countries. Next slide, please. Regarding supply of imports, uh, well, why do we need imports? Um, the demand exceeds the potential domestic production, as I mentioned. And we also want to maintain the energy hub function of the Dutch ports. This is, uh, the Dutch ports play a very important role in Europe regarding uh, energy flows of oil, uh, gas, uh, LNG. Um, and, and we want to maintain this uh, position. Netherlands is very important for the uh, work capacity in the Netherlands. Um, and we see that um, hydrogen can play an important role in the, in the, the, the ports in the Netherlands uh, will also play an important role in this. Which actions are we taking? We, we are having a lot of collaborations via memorandums of understandings uh, with several countries that are positioning themselves, especially as uh, exporters, um, and to also develop uh, together certification schemes. We are having now currently a pilot on certification schemes. Um, uh, which will be definitely crucial to know that we are having clean hydrogen being imported, that this is also produced on the right conditions in the in other countries. Uh, one a very important uh, measure that has recently been announced is uh, the to join the H2 Global Initiative of Germany. Um, these are tenders uh, to be done, uh, two sides tenders, so actually... Um, you buy hydrogen uh, with long uh, long term contracts, and then you sell it on the national uh, market with short term contracts. So in this way, you can guarantee that there will be a uh, large volume of hydrogen, uh, and then you take some uncertainties out of of the system. And, and of course, uh, on um, developing also the IPSE. The third way will be on infrastructure and storage projects. And there we also have reserved some finance, 600 million euros for developing these infrastructure um, needed for imports. Next slide, please. So these are uh, the two main pillars on the supply. On the infrastructure side, um, we, will, we have taken the decision to develop a national transmission grid by 2030. Um, that will have around 1,000 kilometers and it will be connecting the five uh, main industrial sites. So we will begin, uh, we will do this in three phases. The first phase will connect the three main industrial sites in the southern Netherlands with uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and then uh, Groningen. And also connecting the first storage location sites in the northern Netherlands with the first interconnectors to Germany. Um, then uh, the second connection will be made to the southern uh, western part of the Netherlands um, and uh, also connecting to Belgium. Uh, and in the end, this whole loop of hydrogen backbone will be closed, also favoring um, the, the, the um, level of, of security that you will get hydrogen if this is a whole uh, a closed loop. Uh, we will develop next to the transmission line also for salt cameras for hydrogen storage in 2030. We need this large scale storage to uh, balance out differences in uh, supply and demand. 
Um, and after 2030, we're looking to developing uh, also offshore electrolysis uh, like uh, the ones in here on the left uh, on a really large scale um, and coupled to all the wind uh, ambitions that we have established. Next slide, please. The third pillar I mentioned was the international cooperation and uh, our strategy is um, focused on the five different elements. So we need to create a European market providing a certainty on the infrastructure, on the certification, on the regulation. So we're working on all these conditions to provide clarity to the market. Uh, of course, we are dependent on the negotiations ongoing on the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, so we are awaiting these results. Um, further, a uh, very important component is uh, to learn from the first import projects. So that's why we're also funding via IPSE import projects. We need to know what is needed in terms of regulations and infrastructure by learning by doing. So we find this very important. As well, uh, we want to facilitate the import-export chains with uh, countries within the European Union, but also um, outside. Uh, therefore, we are uh, having these MOUs um, and collaborating on uh, knowledge sharing, on establishing uh, what is needed on regulations and certification schemes. And, and important thing is we're not doing this alone. So uh, we know that there's a large... The conditions in Germany and Belgium are quite similar in the Netherlands. So we work together with our neighbors to develop EU, uh, European policy and as well the bilateral relations are very important. Um, and as well, we are uh, strongly present in a lot of uh, multilateral organizations such as the um, International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy, the Clean Energy Ministerial, Mission Innovation, uh, very close contact with the IEA working on hydrogen. Uh, and these are our main five um, strategic points um, being uh, implemented for the international cooperation. Uh, and lastly, uh, next slide, I would like to um, mention um, this one is not seen correctly, but uh, we have established a national hydrogen program. So besides what we do um, also on international level, it's very important to bring all the stakeholders together, which are developing the hydrogen value chains in the country. Uh, so this has um, been a public-private initiative. Um, it was uh, announced in, um, in the climate agreement already that, it, that we would do this from 2022. And we have been using the last two years to prepare for this. The aim is to connect, facilitate, accelerate, and to monitor the progress. Um, so now uh, this, uh, this photo here was last year where there was a, um, a work plan for the, uh, for the program, which was prepared and presented to our uh, state secretary. She's receiving that at, at the moment from some of the um, initiators of, of this uh, working plan. Um, and early this year, the officially the National Hydrogen Program began in February this year um, to implement this working plan. And one of the very important actions was to develop a hydrogen roadmap together with the public and private parties that are involved. So we have been um, going through this process the last uh, months. And in November, we will present a new hydrogen roadmap until 2030 and uh, what, what actions and, and milestones are we expecting. Uh, with that, I would like to finish my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to know if there are any questions or anything you'd like to further know. Thank you. Yeah, uh, enlightening on how Netherlands, within a short period of time, is able to build its own uh, uh, hydrogen agenda, and it is uh, being followed up by another part of the countries as well, including in the world. <laughs> and we've learned from Akala on a various uh, strategy that has been deployed by the Netherlands. So I think we come to the part where we could ask questions to the uh, keynote speakers of today. Those of you who are online, please uh, submit your questions uh, in the chat box and later it will be related to me directly. And I would like to invite uh, Pa Hagen to come on stage uh, where we would like to have uh, discussions. 
where we would like to explore what will be the potential collaboration between Netherlands and Indonesia and how we can uh, therefore fit further from today's on. Um, but maybe before we come to the questions from the audience, I would like to maybe ask the speaker themselves to reflect on the presentations from uh, each other countries and whether you have some questions. So maybe I would like to ask uh, Pahagung, do you have any particular questions to uh, Carla okay. with regards to this? Yes. Thank you, Professor Bayou. Uh, hi, Carla. Um, I hope still there. Um, yeah, based on your presentation, I think that uh, Netherlands, has, as what you mentioned, is has a, a, a bit quick steps ahead than other countries. But still, um, we are um, we understand that the, the still uh, undergoing to re, to revise the regulation and also looking for the fixed market in the future. Please, please, so, have a seat. please have a seat. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So, my quick question is. Uh, uh, you mentioned about subsidy. So, uh, how how do you develop that subsidies? I mean, like, how, I'm not sure about that. Is that a subsidy to in the production side, producer side, or the consumer side? So, so how do you? I mean, I mean, I mean, like, it's it's a bit technical, but not really. Uh, you don't need to answer in in very technical. I think that you just need to wrap a bit give us uh, a direction how to develop the subsidy uh, uh, to to call it, uh, to to foster this hydrogen uh, energy i think that's yeah. that's the main question from us yeah okay so uh, carla please uh, thank you, you could, yes uh, that's a question um where we already uh, have also been discussing this for a long time so where do we need to begin stimulating and, and financing the projects there's definitely a very large gap between gray hydrogen and, and clean hydrogen. So therefore we decided to in the begin in the beginning to have subsidies on the production side and to cover this difference between what clean hydrogen cost and non-gray hydrogen uh, cost at the okay. moment. The current okay. gas prices are helping to have this uh, gap even lower. <laughs> so um, in, in the future, we expect that then the, the difference will be shorter uh, of smaller and smaller, and then you will need less um, subsidies on the production side. And, and therefore, mm -hmm. then we are looking into other instruments to also stimulate the demands. Uh, and and mm -hmm. one of them could be contracts, um, carbon contracts for difference. Um, but you could also think about obligations uh, to have different quotas on the uptake of clean hydrogen in the different sectors. And, and these will, in the end, also have to be in line with uh, what the European regulation is um, so from the Fit for 55 package and also repower you. So um, I think that that's, um, that's where we, our focus has been until now, but we see that in the future we'll have to have a shift into uh, stimulating more the demand. Okay. Yeah, so, so maybe a follow-up to that uh, uh, answer from you, Akala, because yeah. I, uh, I worked here for a number of years now, 14 years, and I know that there is also an, uh, an ongoing development with the Groens uh, Vermogen Free funds or growth funds, and uh, is is this also part of the subsidy scheme that you are mm -hmm. uh, mentioning just now? So we have mm -hmm. these Green uh, Vermogens where we try to stimulate public-private partnerships, okay. uh, and it is quite a large number of uh, money that is involved there. But maybe Carla, you can explain a bit more about this Green uh, Vermogen. Yes, so Groen Vermogen, it's uh, basically focused on research and innovation and on having the upscale of. Uh, the, the that would be like the second phase we see an upscaling of electrolyzers, so up to more than 100 megawatts. Um, and a, a very strong uh, point is on the human capital agenda within uh, uh, Groen Vermogen. Um, and, and we see this uh, mainly as having innovative technology scaling up. So for, for we have other instruments. Uh, I know it's quite com uh, uh, very uh, complicated the scheme we have developed because we have different uh, mm -hmm. subsidy schemes uh, and and even within 
more general subsidy schemes for technologies that are reducing CO2 emissions, for example, SDE, a hydrogen projects could also apply for this. So those are not specifically made for hydrogen, but are general for the energy system. And, and these are also subsidy schemes available for hydrogen projects. Um, so in parallel to Groen Vermogen, there are around 838 million euros uh, research for that project um, that would be implemented in the coming uh, five to eight years. Um, but uh, next to that, we have the upscaling uh, instruments with 250 million euros mm -hmm. for only electrolyzers projects. Then with IPSE, 1.4 billion euros for the second and the third wave. So looking into also hydrogen production and infrastructure projects. Um, and we have more subsidies for infrastructure. So also for the hydrogen backbone, we have committed 750 million euros, and which is the, the half of the total costs of this uh, development of this backbone. So those are the main uh, places where we are putting the money in our strategies and where we see that it's needed um, because at the moment um, the, the, the costs are just too high to be able to develop this type of infrastructure. Mm. Yes. So thank you, Carla, for the clear uh, explanation on that. Yep. And maybe I would like to change the direction. Now I would like to maybe invite Carla. Do you have any particular questions for the Indonesian uh, government in this Okay, regard? please, Carla. I would like to hear from you. Yes. Uh, now really nice to know where you're uh, working on that hydrogen is uh, becoming very important. Um, I was wondering, how do you see the collaboration between um, Indonesia and the Netherlands and regarding hydrogen? Where can we uh, strengthen this collaboration uh, to become really uh, partners uh, uh, in hydrogen and development? Okay, okay. So, yeah. Pagan, please. Yes, Carla. Um, first of all, I would like to respond on your answers. That uh, based on your answer about subsidy and the, the, the what is collaboration between private and, and government, I think uh, this hydrogen uh, things, I said that the process electrolyzes until the production itself needs co collaboration for private government and probably commercial banks. Is that, are you included in commercial bank? Because like now, now that we are heavier, one of the state-owned banks, uh, uh, participant from the Maniri. So um, probably we, we need to elaborate on that later on. Okay, second thing is that oh, you asked about the, the opportunity of collaboration between Indonesia and Netherlands. Well, the first one, first thing first, uh, we uh, probably has a big opportunity in terms of the uh, technology transfers. But we, we all know that the, the technology uh, price of uh, processing the hydrogen is still high, and it still needs um, uh, uh, only certain country that has this advanced technology. So probably we we could have that the technology transfer. And then the second thing is, is we probably uh, has opportunity to develop uh, the same pages. I mean, if you have your your roadmap by the end of this year, probably we can share the this roadmap so we can support those roadmaps. See, so. Once you produce, as you can, as a producers, you can. We also can probably follow your road, the roadmap of the Netherlands. So we are, we are, we are very uh, uh, believe that uh, uh, our government has the ability uh, also to strengthen this this uh, this this uh, roadmap. That's the second things. The third one is how do we uh, can collaborate on uh, looking at the opportunity of the the global market. I know uh, nowadays uh, uh, there are dynamics of uh, geopolitics between Russia and Ukraine, uh, and I think that will not be like until 2030. So after that, we can follow uh, the the strategy to the the the, the, the how the hydrogen uh, would uh, be one of the economy uh, of um, I mean hydrogen to be uh, the commodity that can be. Uh, produce particularly and uh, produce an economic and commercial production with, uh, among the countries in Europe or every any countries in, in the world in the world. I think that's all. Okay, thank you, Pag. Mm, yeah. But maybe as a follow up to the questions by Carla, mm. I'd like to uh, to ask so because mm. in uh, her presentations, mm. we saw that there 
has been a number of a uh, letter of intentions or MOU mm. with regards to the hydrogen economy, and I do not see Indonesia there at all. Mm. Is there any already an ongoing discussions with the Netherlands in that regards? Uh, no, not yet, not yet. But probably this is the, the good momentum part. Yes, <laughs> yeah, right. this, this. At, at the moment, we are still uh, looking at the opportunity of uh, how to uh, retire the power plant based on coal, the yeah, early retirement from the uh, coal power plants. And now uh, we are, in terms of uh, substitute the, the coal power plants, we are uh, 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 try to develop more on the, the hydro power, uh, wind power, and the solar panel power plants. And we we also have a big potential in the, the geothermal plant. Uh, so there's also, uh, uh, but then uh, hydrogen came up is is one of the resources of the energy for for I mean could be for energy power electricity could be for the the, the vehicles. Then right. I think it's we have to be very uh, sensitive but right. in 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 the global terms. But so yes. So I know Australia, Japan, Korea, and. Uh, is one of the uh, three of country that has been play on the, uh, the hydrogen and they try to develop on that. Yeah, they probably could be the producers also has demands in the future. So, if our neighbor countries, uh, the closest one is Australia, we haven't seen the, the Malaysia or the Vietnam are doing this, but probably we need to be able to be sensitive, not to be worsened off in the future. So that's why we have to understood and we have to follow. What other neighbor countries are doing in terms of policy? But this this is a um, the the ultimate goals. The objective is just to reduce the emissions in the future and looking for the energy alternative, which is less expensive than uh, what uh, have we have today for from the fossil fuel. I think that's that's the idea. But yeah. right. So thank you, uh, Prahagan, for the clarifications. I, yeah. I think. We should uh, follow it up uh, in the discussions with the Netherlands on these uh, collaborations. And you you bring an important aspect with regards to the demand side, because you're mentioning about the mobility and also the uptake by the uh, industry. And uh, we have seen as well from presentations of Carla that uh, there is a high demand in the Netherlands while the production is quite uh, still low and then that is the part where uh, the government try to increase the, the productions and this is related to questions by the uh, audience from uh, youtube in particular what is actually where is the demand come from in the netherlands mm. can you elaborate on that aspect uh, Carla? is it uh, something from the the mobility part or it is more the transportations or is it in the industry which can use this for their energy but. Yeah, mainly at, at the moment is the industry and using it as, as a feedstock. Um, so in the production of other mm -hmm. materials such as ammonia production and also in the refinery process of uh, oil, uh, these are the main current uses. So of course, in the future, we want to look into new uses and especially in, in uses where um, where only hydrogen is the, the good alternative for a high temperature heating in, in industry. You cannot electrify that or very hardly. So then you would use hydrogen. But also we see in mobility, we already have uh, some uh, trucks are going on uh, hydrogen. We had a pilot on uh, trains, uh, also with the uh, first pilots with shipping on hydrogen. So we see for few of these types of applications that it will become more and more important. And of course, in the end, uh, for uh, aviation, also for sustainable um, uh, aviation fuels. We see a large role for hydrogen, uh, and this will mean that actually the, there will be a shift on the current use of hydrogen to more the new uses of hydrogen, um, and uh, that, that is more looking into the future. Yeah, yeah so it's uh, clear that actually the use of uh, hydrogen is not only for the yeah. feedstock, but could also be the source yeah. for the high temperature yeah. in yeah. Uh, industry and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think I, 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 I agree on that, that. The, what Carla mentioned uh, at the, the last part was about the, the the hydrogen power for the aeroplane. That makes sense, I think. So, so it it doesn't make sense we, we if we're going to build aeroplane with the battery because the heavy 
uh, of the battery. But doing, using hydrogen, I think that's one of the 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 the, the uh, probably the most significant change in the the, the aeroplane. Uh, I think I agree on that. And the second thing is is uh, uh, I think uh, what what happened in in Netherlands uh, from the color presentation was uh, you have been have you had uh, the 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 infrastructure Carla, as the pipeline has been built and probably I, my assumption is was the pipeline previously used with the, well for the gas but now you you can use for the hydrogen so so that's that's the advantages in Netherlands but you have the pipelines already put but uh that in that case uh in Indonesia probably if you want to uh, have the similar things that we have to to build and develop the pipelines uh, across the, the nation which is not that uh, simple and and that right. that's a cheap yeah okay. yes yeah, sorry I, I, I really I, did mention yeah, that go ahead, but, go ahead, <laughs> that the infrastructure that's true the backbone we are developing is 80 percent of the infrastructure will be reutilized and then only 20% oh, okay. will have to be new pipelines and new infrastructure. You need to change yeah, the compressors yeah, yeah. That as well. Yeah. But the, mm -hmm. the costs are a four times lower if we reutilize these pipelines than building a new pipelines for this whole infrastructure. So, of course, we there have a, a very uh, good position in the Netherlands uh, to, to start with. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, one of the final questions from my side, I'm uh, looking at the questions. Yeah. Um, it is re regarding the uh, the way the Netherlands has set up the infrastructure. So you have seen the the, the, yeah. the backbone that has been set up, but also the uh, human capital. Mm. So there has been a quite a significant investment to try to prepare the workers in the future. And University of Groningen here we have mechanical engineering where one particular track is focused on the hydrogen technology. Oh, I see. We also have a, a, a chemical engineering where one of the track is also focusing on a hydrogen technology. Mm -hmm. And in collaborations with uh, University of Applied Sciences where there will come more highly skilled people that are prepared for this uh, yeah. new economy. Uh, would that also be part of the roadmap uh, in your opinion in Indonesia? Uh, yeah. Uh, the could be part, Professor Blake, right? Then well, one of the focus from the president's uh, agenda is uh, to develop the, the human resources, but not specifically for the hydrogen study, but, but then things if you have those uh, and we have that demands in the future, probably we are yeah, there's an opportunity to have that. But uh, I think I agree on you, but uh, the, the 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 capacity scale of the human resource needs to be improved. So uh through the campus, are probably running on with the ETB or the ETS, probably or or anyone in in, in Indonesia University. Probably, yep. I can I can mention this to the the the, uh, the, the PIC from the education sector, right. and uh, probably this is a good also opportunity to have a collaboration in education. Yes. And uh, I believe in the future there is this is this is something. But if as you mentioned, it is it is included in the mechanical. Engineering and the chemical engineering, yeah, probably in Indonesia we can put in specific like vocational study yeah. with this, we under the engineering uh, faculty or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, I think we are uh, at the closing of this sessions, and I would like to give uh, one more opportunity to the speaker to give one final remark if okay. there is. Yeah. So I would like to probably invite Pak Pahagam maybe. Uh, yeah, one oh, one small yes. remark. Uh, yes, and re regarding this, uh, uh, so thank you for this. Um, no, no, just one small thing, um, because you also asked about the collaboration between Indonesia and the Netherlands, and this is a beautiful example on how this collaboration is already ongoing. Huh? So in uh, the J20 in, in Bali, uh, our ministers signed an MOU on sharing knowledge on energy transition. And, yes. and this is one of the activities also in, in that case. So we are already working very closely together on, on the hydrogen, on other aspects of the energy transition and on sharing knowledge and developing new, um, also uh, capacitating new people uh, on this topic. So yeah, very glad to, to already have this wonderful collaboration. Thank you, Akala. And there is actually one question from the audience. Uh, Raymond. Okay. Give the opportunity. Okay. So one short question. Correct. 
Yeah. 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 Thank you. Salah. Thank you, Pak. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lydian from Bang Mandiri, who come, uh, come here from Jakarta, where I think we're going to be here. Uh, interesting to see your material about hydrogen. And uh, as a bank, we always see the opportunity and also the And in our country, uh, like Pa uh, said, actually, we are focusing on this. This, yes. We are. We, we are also from Bank Mandiri. Uh, try to support our government policy. Uh, uh, concerning the renewable energy, and as we know until now, the government uh, policy about the energy mix, not included hydrogen. Maybe after 2050, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so I think this is uh, something new for us. Something new for us. That's why when we uh, see the topics, uh, we are interesting. And then, uh, so uh, as you know, in ASEAN, uh, now the renewables energy is about battery technology. But battery technology, you see in Indonesia now is very happening about uh, uh, electric vehicles powered by battery. So my question is, should we uh, worry about this technology? Because when we go to the our portfolio, uh, you know that this will be long term. Uh, should this technology will replace the battery technology? Uh, so we have to anticipate and how is the I, I don't know this is uh, now under process to uh, to be economical yeah? uh, because one of your plan is to cost reduction actually uh, in this uh, te technology and the second one would you please uh, share us about your energy mix uh, plan uh, in Netherlands, uh, how big the hydrogen portion in your energy mix plan in the future? I think that is my uh, two question. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, thank you for the question. And Donna, maybe you can uh, address that question. Uh, Perfect. Thank you for the questions. Uh, great questions. I think we don't have to see uh, the, as a competition batteries and hydrogen. And it's so much energy what we need. And uh, both hydrogen and batteries are energy carriers that are very important and also for different types of uses. So electric vehicles will remain uh, the large amount of personal vehicles uh, in the world in the coming uh, years. Um, and, and this is because that's more efficient. Eh? If you use electricity directly, of course, that is better than converting to hydrogen and then using hydrogen. So for the short distances and in between cities, battery electric vehicles are very um, strong and will be strong in the future to come. So no worries about competitions. Um, but if we look at the long uh, distance segments, hydrogen becomes a very uh, uh, feasible and economic um alternative. So looking at uh, uh, trucks uh, for transporting goods, at trains, uh, ships, uh, aviation, you also need a hydrogen. And also for personal vehicles, once the technology is developed and it's Recording also- Recording in progress. The, the, and also the cost will go down, then it also becomes uh, attractive. And if you think all the electricity cables and the reinforcing the infrastructure that is needed to electrify all mobility, now we're talking about electrifying heat, this will be also not feasible. So actually, you can use hydrogen in places where you don't have the right infrastructure on electricity to support it. So I see it really as complementary uh, technologies, not competitive. And that's the way we should go forward. We need all solutions if we want to have a, a, an energy transition. And regarding your um, second question, um, Sorry, I forgot what it was. Uh, it's kind of energy, energy, mix. On energy mix on the energy mix in the Netherlands. Yes, the we, we think that uh, in 20, looking at 2050, around one quarter of the energy needs uh, okay. could be supplied by hydrogen 
um, and also uh, by um, green gas. Um, so if we look at molecules, uh, at, at mm. the, and now at, uh, at this yeah. moment, we only have 20% of our energy needs are electrified. So even if we put a lot of windmills, a lot of uh, uh, solar panels, we need to have more electrification of our en energy uses. And even if we double that, we'll be around 40 to 50%. That's already a large challenge. And the rest mm. of it has to be supplied by molecules, green hydrogen, green methane, um, and of course, in the transition, we will still need natural gas, but in the end, we want to replace this with green molecules and electrify even further our energy uses. So I think, uh, yeah, I hope I give an answer to your question um, and, and think, just yeah, the message have, uh, everything, yeah. not just one or the other technology. Right, so uh, thank you, Carla, again, and thank you, Pahago, yep. for, uh, uh, for your uh, clear explanations yep. about the policy. and. Let's give a round of applause to uh, both of you. And uh, I would like to invite everyone for a short break and we will return back at uh, half past 11 Netherlands time. Thank you. Thank you, what about you?
Welcome everyone again to the next part of today's sessions. And in this part, we will learn more about the uh, technology development as well as the commercializations aspect or the, the use of the hydrogen in an industry. So we will uh, learn directly from the uh, technology uh, developer as well as the, uh, the, the user uh, from three different uh, speakers. And I'm happy to uh, introduce the first one who is a, a famous or important person in Groningen that has led the, the uh, development of Groningen Hydrogen Campus. His name is uh, Professor Aravin Purusataman Felayani. He's currently the professor at uh, Energy and Sustainable Research Institute Groningen, and he's also the chair of energy conversions in this institute. And Aravin has actually led a number of uh, big projects in uh, Europe as well as in the Netherlands in the uh, development of a new hydrogen technology as well as in the uh, applications of a hydrogen in various domains. And uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Aravin to present us about your uh, experience in the research and education on the hydrogen. Aravin? Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh... Very, very good morning to, to all. I'm very happy to be here uh, and to discuss the, the, the developments in the north of Netherlands and uh, at the University of Groningen. So let me just start with sharing my screen. And uh, so screen is changed. Is the screen now, is, are the slides visible now? Hello? Yes, 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 it's okay. clear. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So I will talk about hydrogen research and education activities, uh, which are probably necessary to support the very large scale transition that's taking place in the region. So uh, what is that transition and what's happening, what's going on, and then the details. That's what probably I will try to discuss today. So the larger picture, uh, in the Netherlands, there is significant momentum with hydrogen transition. And um, main focus till now is large scale electrolysis and hydrogen transport, uh, then hydrogen mobility is catching up. And all these uh, activities needs knowledge support. And funding is also foreseen. So we are also several, developing several knowledge based activities. And if you look at uh, national level, there is growth fund, uh, 300 million euro plus activity uh, in which uh, hydrogen transition and the knowledge support necessary uh, is considered important. So we are actually working on it, but also many other universities. So uh, Dutch academia will probably have sufficient funding in, in working on hydrogen related technologies in the near future. And similarly, um, well, in the North Netherlands, part of Just Transition Fund. The whole Just Transition Fund is again 300 million euro plus program. And part of that we hope uh, could be used for, for, uh, for, for developing the, the hydrogen knowledge infrastructure. And then, um, well, Groningen is in the north of Netherlands, but coming to Groningen, there's also national program Groningen, uh, which is uh, probably a 1 billion euro plus uh, program. And a part of this money is also expected to flow uh, to, in order to support uh, the hydrogen uh, knowledge initiatives. So if you look at in the north of Netherlands, in, in Groningen, we are um, in, in a relatively interesting position where we actually have to, to mobilize activities, uh, uh, expecting funding from multiple very large programs and hopefully supporting one of the most important hydrogen transition initiatives that's taking place in the world. And what is that? Now, as of now, Groningen, well, Groningen used to be the largest natural gas field in Europe, very well connected with international um, piping, pipe networks to carry the natural gas produced, to store it here, and then to take it to, to other places and to other countries. But natural gas production is coming to an end. And this is probably because of earthquakes. And then uh, if that happens, well, because of the natural gas, Groningen and the North Netherlands, is well known for the energy economy. 
But if nat natural gas production uh, is stopping completely, is it possible to, to continue with the energy economy in the region? Luckily, we possibly have a solution, an emerging solution. That's to look at hydrogen to replace natural gas. How? Where this hydrogen to come? If you look at North Sea, uh, the wind energy potential in North Sea is enormous. So uh, tens or 100 gigawatt plus space time. Now, if you have wind turbines, if you have wind energy produced, then it's possible to, 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 to use operate electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And there are salt caverns uh, in North Netherlands, and it's possible to, to, to store hydrogen probably in these salt caverns. And then we have natural gas pipelines connecting uh, Groningen to uh, North Netherlands to other regions and other countries. And if you repurpose these natural gas pipelines, then it's possible also to transport uh, hydrogen from this region to other places. So that is probably a good starting point for, uh, for uh, setting up uh, hydrogen economy here. So that's actually a very important hydrogen transition. And that's why probably the first hydrogen valley in Europe is now in, in the North Netherlands. So the first hydrogen valley in Europe might be one of its very few such uh, concentrated efforts anywhere in the world. Uh, this is an opportunity, but also it's a challenge because if you do something uh, as a first timer, then you have to be extra careful. And, and uh, but this actually such a project involves thoughts about very large electrolyzer systems to be to, to come up in the future, uh, and then um, and maybe even hydrogen utilization plants. There's a truck building facility coming up, uh, so there is a, 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 a companies are looking at uh, repurposing some of the salt caverns or maybe even starting up with new caverns. And, and on the top of that, there is also an environment of environmentally friendliness in the in the region. There was also a net zero initiative in which for biomass and bioenergy and hydrogen, etc., all play important roles. So this is what is happening in, in Groningen and in the North Netherlands. A serious hydrogen transition that's taking place mostly from, uh, from uh, natural gas to hydrogen and natural gas producing region, an important natural gas producing region in Europe, the largest gas field, is now being converted to completely say a hydrogen region. And this is an important transition and that needs proper knowledge support. So what we are trying to build up is called uh, Hydrogen Valley Campus Europe. And well, uh, we are now starting from zero. There are already ongoing activities, likely because if you have such a transition taking place, things do come around. And if you look at, we have, uh, we have for example, uh, uh, facilities such as uh, Hydro Hub, which is, uh, which is becoming a megawatt scale electrolyzer test center. And then we have an airport interested in hydrogen transition. And then we have some of the large companies such as DNV uh, moving to, to uh, uh, our campus, setting up, um, for example, an 80 person hydrogen facility and other companies interested. So things are coming together. So what we look for is a facility which could be used for industrial testing, but also academic research and large scale training, because there are 20,000 or more employees in the natural gas industry and the energy industry in the North. If a transition takes place, all these uh, people, all these employees will have to be retrained for, for hydrogen industry. So you also need training facilities. So we want to have facilities useful for industry, academic research, and for training. And building upon and connecting properly the existing facilities in the region. So this is a joint initiative with the University of Groningen and the Hansa University of Applied Sciences, New Energy Coalition, and other key society partners from uh, partners uh, from the region to form uh, to to uh, come up with this hydrogen valley. Uh, and and we are expecting to attract a total investment of capital of around 150 to 160 million euro um, in, in say next 10, next 10 years. So um, this is a major initiative as far as we are concerned. So let's look at um, uh, what all, well, this is not a, a complete list, uh, at least uh, some of the important knowledge lines and the areas and where there is expertise 
at the university are just listed. So electrolysis and fuel cells. Uh, so hydro hub, we have large scale electrolysis coming up. We have fuel cell testations from the electrodes to cell to stacks to systems. Uh, uh, and some of them are operational, some of them are coming up. Then there is there are uh, good academic groups, well experienced, well reputed academic groups working on electrochemistry, material science, all needed for 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 developing uh, and operating uh, electrolysis and fuel cells efficiently and in a reliable way. Chemi chemistry and chemical engineering, control system engineering. You also need to control these systems in order to to have in order to ensure uh, long life, but also efficiency. And you know there are other problems with hydrogen embrittlement because hydrogen is a small molecule and it can get into uh, into to, uh, to materials and, uh, and and the embrittlement is not a non problem. So we have people working on it. Storage, especially underground storage, but Geo Energy team is working on underground storage um, uh, uh, and especially in salt ca salt caverns. And we have a good combustion um, uh, group and facility and and. Uh, so the combustion facility is and could be used for hydrogen safety studies with either hydrogen uh, based on hydrogen combustion or combustion of hydrogen mixtures. Uh, economics, uh, economic viability of these systems and, and um, uh, uh, looking at the future prospects. Acceptance studies, again, psychology based of what of these interventions are acceptable to the larger public and why. That's also important if you really think about a very large scale transition. Regulations from energy law. Uh, well, um, sometimes some of the rules might actually prevent a technology being introduced, and and you might have to either modify the rules or improve the technology. So you need uh, uh, the technologies and, and regulators to work together. So the energy law, uh, the the faculty of law also is energy law is also quite well known in Groningen. So they are also uh, involved. And special sciences. That's another faculty because you know you have to to uh, to to distribute all these systems and components. Uh, uh, geographically in an effective way, and that's where spatial sciences people step in. So uh, let's look at uh, HydroHub. Uh, this is a sub um, megawatt scale test stations for electrolyzers. Industry is involved. Uh, PhD research is focused on um, uh, system studies, integrated system testing, but also materials development. So uh, NTech and Estre, uh, two two departments, two institutes. Within the, within the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Uh, so we all have connected acti activities. Professor Paolo Pascomona, who will come after uh, later today to, to, to discuss uh, their activities, is actually uh, officially in charge of, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the roof hydro hub connections. Uh, so low temperature electrolysis are there. We hope that maybe it's also in the future we can bring in high temperature solid oxygen electrolysis, et cetera. So large scale uh, system test facility. We hope to connect it with proper stack testing facility, cell testing, testing facility, electrode testing facility, and even catalyst testing facility, all in the, on the campus as a part of the Hydrogen Valley Initiative. So what is there in HydroHub? Uh, make it complete, but also connect it properly with knowledge groups at University of Groningen, but also at Hansa University of Applied Sciences. That's also part of the campus Valley Initiative. So we would like to have a, a, a hydrogen and fuel cell lab where companies and knowledge institutions share facility to generate synergies, allowing small and medium scale business to grow, startups to flourish, large companies to invest in our region. So key features include testing of cell stacks and complete systems, incorporating advanced measurement tools, low temperature and high temperature system, fuel flexible and reversible systems, and all connected properly with hydro hub megawatt scale test center, maybe also hopefully with TNO HESI lab, industry facilities, et cetera. A knowledge hub, a comprehensive knowledge hub, where actually technical knowledge and natural sciences cooperate with social sciences. You know, if you develop a technology or if you're testing a technology, to what extent these technologies are acceptable to people or, or, or what are the regulations in properly deploying these technologies or, or whether these are economically viable or geographically or spatially how to spread them. This is all to be studied uh, with scientists work uh, in, in engineering and, uh, and natural sciences, uh, scientists working with social science, um, uh, researchers from social science, uh, related fields. So that's actually could be quite unique also in, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in the Netherlands at least because we have uh, as the University of Groningen, 
there is a faculty of science and engineering which is quite strong and then we have several other faculties where actually which are not probably there in many of the technical universities so that's where actually we really hope to have full fledged knowledge support to this large scale transition by connecting different knowledge domains and then we need training program if we have 20 25000 people to be retrained we need to have large scale training programs we have experience from eu projects such as no high and teach high so no high project i have led the project we have trained around 800 trainees in hydrogen technologies with innovative teaching approaches in different countries in europe and uh, teach high we are actually starting a full european msc program to be taught at several european universities on hydrogen fuel cell technologies which Uh, many lectures available in recorded mode to be taught in blended mode so that's actually uh, connecting us with ongoing activities in europe and even playing a leading role in uh, such activities in europe but also making use of these opportunities uh, for for fulfilling the local requirements so we aim to try uh, train around 20 25000 professionals in next 10 years while well, research center of course we also would like to have start up ecosystem here uh, with people capable of contributing with technical solutions required for large scale implementation of hydrogen technology for multiple applications but we hope to have facilities test facilities complementary facilities not only in konyan but also in other nearby cities such as luwaden mn etc so yeah Arvind. Yeah uh you have about 3 uh, minutes left. Uh, okay. Is it okay for you to try yeah. to uh, speed up? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, just to expand uh, environmental and social psychology to look at acceptance studies, energy law about regulations uh, and and uh, uh, and etc et etc legal factors for transition to hydrogen based society and command and control instruments etc economics and business uh looking at uh, ensuring economic conditions for rest to adoption because everything what we do should be economically viable and uh, special sciences uh looking at regional allo- regional allocation of facilities uh, and and economic spin off etc etc so different knowledge lines all working together and then within my own group we look at um, hydrogen and fuel cell teaching programs development of high efficiency systems electrochemistry and fuel oxidation electrolysis and reversible fuel cell systems transportation applications uh, maritime aircraft etc etc and waste to energy waste to hydrogen etc but an important part is this is for example a european program no high for training large scale a large number of hydrogen fuel cell technicians using the limited facilities available with a, based on innovative approaches and we have trained around uh, 7 800 technicians in europe in many countries in different languages in a year at the end of the in the final year of the program and actually we have all offered this training pro- training programs for a free only in one city in europe those days and that was actually for uh, and different universities etc were all all involved teach high is a similar program a full msc program to be taught uh, in in different uh, european universities these lectures are also going to be probably available uh, and and uh, for building up local msc programs and we hope to make use of several of these lectures to have specialization uh, lines for um, hydrogen specialization opportunities for different msc programs uh, within within the university if we are able if we are successful with our uh, our efforts but i think this is also this program to which we can actually have other uh, universities maybe from indonesia to join in the future so that's all from my side thank you very much thank you arafin for the clear uh, presentations and let's give a round of applause to arafin today so uh i would like to uh, invite the next speaker and it will be presented by Butina Kamala who is currently the director of human resources government and risk management at uh, PT Pupuk Indonesia uh, i think without any further ado i would like to invite uh, Butina to uh, tell us a bit more on the uh, PT Pupuk Indonesia thank you thank you Good morning and good afternoon from Indonesia. Great honor for me to be invited here as a representative of Pupuk Indonesia. 
di Indonesia set on enterprise which manufactures fertilizer. I'm also a chairperson of Sri Kandi BUMN, DSO is women leader uh, community. I would like to thank the, the committee from the Embassy of Indonesia in Netherlands, ECADIN, and the ITB Alumni Association for this opportunity. I would also like to extend my warm greetings to mm. Bapak Mayor Vas, Bapak Hageng Nugroho, Mrs. Carla Rob Ledo, Prof. Bayu as moderator, fellow speakers, and all participants in the meeting room. Based on what we heard so far from the fellow speakers before me, the future of hydrogen as clean energy is very attractive for the global industry. We must build capacity and value creation to strengthen our capacity and capability to lead green and sustainable industry initiatives. Today, I would like to present the urgency and how the Pupuk Indonesia Group will embrace and pre prepare for this transformative shift and business model. Indonesia is among the countries prone to climate change impact until now, one degree Celsius temperature rise causes floods, drought, and other disasters. By 2050, IPCC predicted that the increase in average temperature would reach 1.7 degrees Celsius. It would bring much disastrous impact on society. Thus, the Indonesian government committed to accelerating global net zero and submitted the National Determined Contribution, or NDC, in Paris Agreement. The updated NDC stated a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 31.89% with its own capabilities and 43.2% with foreign assistance. The government of Indonesia also has already issued carbon tax and pricing regulations related to these matters. I would like to explain about the recent organization structure under Ministry of SOEs. There are 12 clusters under two vice ministers. Each of them divided into six clusters. Pupuk Indonesia is included in food and fertilizer industry sector. As part of SOEs, together we are build strategic business initiatives, strengthening competitiveness, synergy, and performance, and also creating sustainability growth in Indonesia economy. In 2021, Pupuk Indonesia ranked seventh in revenue and profit among SOEs. Pupuk Indonesia itself, the largest fertilizer, including ammonia producer in Southeast Asia, has an important role in Indonesia agriculture development and food security. Our total production capacity is around 14.9 million tons per year for urea and NPK, with ammonia production around 6.3 million, million tons per year. We are a state on enterprise that is responsible to create a sustainable agri-food system. We produce various types of fertilizers, such as urea, NPK, organics, biofertilizer, and other chemicals. To support our core business, Pupuk Indonesia Group provides engineering services, procurement, construction, trading, distribution, energy, utilities, and food. As we know, urea is produced from ammonia, which is reacted with carbon dioxide. Ammonia produced from hydrogen as recently is still convert from fossil fuel or natural gas called gray ammonia. We realize that transformation into a more sustainable industry is a must to, to create more sustainable pro product and uh, businesses. We have more than 60 years of experience 
as an ammonia producer since 1959. Thus, we strongly believe our capability to gain the right momentum to transform as a chemical and clean energy provider. This is the moment of truth for us, uh, for our business transformation to near uh, future. Now, we are still in this stage. We produce gray ammonia for our fertilizer. In the near future, it would shift into blue and green ammonia in the following process. In the future, ammonia from green hydrogen plays a role in electricity and marine fuel supply to meet net zero emission by 2060. The demand will grow significantly over the years until 2060. By the time, ammonia and hydrogen cover 4% of the national energy demand, consisting of 50% of domestic shipping fuel demand, 7% of road transportation, and 4% of electricity generation in Indonesia. To production, uh, the production by 2060 will reach 7 million tons of hydrogen equivalent. Popok Indonesia plans to diversify its green ammonia downstream used to embrace this new market demand in coal-fired power plants and domestic shipping fuel. In order to implement that, Popok Indonesia has established a new task force for blue and green ammonia this year. To support Indonesia's aspiration towards net zero emission by 2060 or sooner, Popok Indonesia has been chosen among six other SOEs to be pioneers in national decarbonization initiatives in 20. Since then, Popok Indonesia has done baselining and verifying its carbon emission quantities. We create the carbonization roadmap initiatives to be realized in the near and long term. The Blue Ammonia project is ready to start in 2025, while Green Ammonia should wait several years to be implemented in our industry, expected to start beyond 20. 30. By 2060, the total target of CO2 reduction emission of PI group is 5 million tons of CO2, equal more than 30% of the total emission in that year. Last week, at SOE International Conference in Nusa Dua Bali, Indonesia, our CEO, Mr. Bakir Pasaman, mentioned the strong commitment of Pupuk Indonesia to be the leader in the green and blue ammonia development despite several challenges. Two significant challenges are supporting policies and the new technology, technology risk. To mitigate this risk, Pupuk Indonesia will start to build a pilot project for green hydrogen to seek viable, viable technology with our partner from many countries. We must ensure the competitive cost to the competitive cost and the benef the best technology be implemented. To cope with the requirements of the new business models, Popok Indonesia needs to accelerate the realization of four main enablers, system, process, people, and infrastructure to meet the market demand. We will shift from only fertilizer and chemical business company into fertilizer, chemical, and energy company. I would like to focus on the aspect of people. There are three main approaches for preparing talent consists of redefining your competency and capabilities, reskilling and upskilling employees' competencies, and the third, for some critical positions, we will recruit professional hire, especially expert in blue and green ammonia technology. Today, Pupuk Indonesia is undergoing a transformation in business streams, human capital, and digitalization. Pupuk Indonesia should strengthen its capabilities in one single platform human capital management system based on our long-term planning 2020 to 2024. 
we determine the ultimate goals of human capital development is to be the world-class human capital. The initiative strategies are as follow, strengthening the organization through a better talent and talent mobility strategy. Second, strengthening talent sourcing, mm. diversity, engagement, and employee evaluation. The third, creating a collaborative and high-performance cal company culture. To achieve these goals, uh, Popok Indonesia brings human capital roadmap for the next uh, three years to deliver high performance, high capability to individuals and teams. Popok Indonesia is fostering quality human resources through increasing competency by deploying top talents to various strategic projects such as the development of the green energy industry. Now we are conducting massive innovation culture for all the employees so we could accelerate the target achievement I have mentioned before. Not only the top talent, we need to change the mindset and focus of the employee from only fulfilling public services obligation into a commercial battleground. Pupuk Indonesia is also committed to increasing the number and quality of top talent by preparing and accelerating the production of superior cadres. This is because uh, 85% of the talent in Popok Indonesia are millennials and only 11% of total female employees. These are our key challenges. We have also a mandatory target from the Ministry of SOEs to increase the participation of this group in board of directors position. The transformation in human capital is performed including the enhancement of millennials and women leaders' participation in 2023 by 10% and 25% respectively. Of course, Indonesia also is having a strong commitment in terms of inclusivity and diversity in the workplace. In the end, we wish to achieve beyond this target to make uh, to make sure they require support for our business transformation, as we know, more diverse organizational uh, structure we will lead to more improvement in the company performance. Mm -hmm. Before I close my presentation, let's watch uh, our company. We are one of the largest fertilizer. We are one of the largest fertilizer company in the world. Our total ammonia production is 6.3 million tons per year, which made us one of the biggest ammonia producers in Asia. Of that amount, we exported almost 1 million ton per year and used the other as raw material for urea production. Pupuk Indonesia also produced fertilizers such as urea, NPK and others with a total production of 13.9 million tons per year. We covered domestic and foreign market through strong distribution network and other supporting facilities. We have also vast experience and expertise in handling ammonia and equipped with extensive facilities such as receiving terminal, ammonia storage, and ammonia vessel. Pupuk Indonesia is currently on development stage of plants of ammonia, urea, methanol, and other adjacent chemicals located in vicinity of natural gas resources. In the short term, we are developing upcoming projects such as Pusri 3B in Palembang and for the middle to long-term plan, we are preparing projects on Lok Sumawe, Yamdina Island and West Papua. We already initiated a decarbonization roadmap to support the government's net zero emission program. We are focusing in the clean energy business with carbon capture facilities and in collaboration with Toyo Engineering, we are planning to develop green hydrogen pilot plant in Lok Sumawe, Aceh. In order to support the government program of net zero emission, Popok Indonesia is ready to carry out carbon trading program initiated by the Ministry of SOE. In 2030, Grey Ammonia International Trade will be around 30 million ton. Meanwhile, Blue and Green Ammonia demand will grow up to 100 million ton, which mostly are used for industrial and agricultural needs. 
With high demand of ammonia in the region, Pupuk Indonesia has a great opportunity to be one of the main players in Asia-Pacific. The forecast by IHS has shown that the world demand for blue and green ammonia will reach up to 103 million tons per year by the end of 2035. We consider this a huge market opportunity for Popok Indonesia Group to develop the ammonia business to meet the blue and green ammonia demand for energy sector. Popok Indonesia believe that ammonia is the hope for the future of clean energy development where ammonia would serve as cheaper and safer hydrogen and energy carrier. Blue ammonia is produced by ammonia plants which are equipped with CO2 storage or utility facilities. As a result, it doesn't have CO2 footprint. Concept of blue ammonia using carbon capture storage and enhanced oil recovery. We are planning to develop this project in various locations such as Aceh, West Java, South Sumatra, and Yamdina Island with collaboration with several SOE, national and foreign partners. This project is planned to start in 2030. Production of green ammonia requires electrolysis to get H2 to make ammonia with no CO2 emission during this process. The use of renewable energy power is mandatory for producing green ammonia. Indonesia have numerous renewable energy sources and with the support of the government, it would benefit green ammonia development in the future. We are developing this project in various locations such as Aceh, West Java and East Kalimantan. We have extensive research in the commercial and policy area for green ammonia. Pupuk Indonesia is focusing on becoming one of the main players in the development of clean energy by initiating green industry cluster in Iskandar Muda industrial area. This special economic zone or SEZ is divided into five areas which are adjusted according to their designation area including chemical, petrochemical, energy, community and agro zones. This cluster would provide added value for Pupuk Iskandar Muda and other stakeholders. Iskandar Muda industrial area is offered as an integrated green and blue chemical with a land area of approximately 130 acres. PT Pupuk Indonesia Persero is committed to produce green, blue ammonia and green energy by collaborating with other companies. Here in Pupuk Indonesia, we prosper with Indonesia.
split uh, area, but of course have experience work in a uh, similar uh, industry. Right. So uh, basically, the idea is to, to exchange uh, uh, experience and uh, knowledge as well, and also potentially having some uh, technology transfer to uh, to Pupuk Indonesia. That right. is uh, clear. And in your presentations, you uh, describe about the current ongoing partnerships with uh, Japan. And uh, I was wondering whether there are already also an existing plan to establish other partnerships with other part of the world. Yes, uh, we still. Uh try to get the right uh, partnership, uh, of course, for blue and green ammonia. And uh, we still open uh, all possibilities, especially <laughs> in global, uh, global networking, global uh, partner. I see. Uh, any questions Badu, from the audience on this aspect? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. So there is a uh, AD from uh, Hasuni uh, has uh, questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question would be uh, with regards to the production of ammonia. Um, do you see Indonesia in the future, let's say, as a net exporter or importer of ammonia? Also, given the thought that um, uh, Indonesia will be the sixth uh largest industrial uh country of the world which we heard this morning um so uh could you elaborate a little bit on that uh thank you uh, okay in this in business per perspective of course uh because we will move to blue and green ammonia uh, business and energy uh any kind of the uh business prospect we would like to uh, create and enhance that uh, area. I see. That's a very short uh, answer. But maybe the, uh, we can uh, elaborate that more potentially when uh, you are coming here uh, live. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, any more? Sorry. Yes, there is a question so, from the back. Yeah. Uh, so from uh, Pa Bambang. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm I'm from uh, ITB uh, alumni, and uh, I was wondering because uh, you are you will be focusing on the on the human capital, so uh, the development of human resources. So I was wondering because in Indonesia there is a trend of big uh, state-owned enterprises to uh, found. So uh, universities like uh, like Telkom and then Pertamina, and I was wondering if there is a, a vision also in this direction from Pupukal team. Of is there already a, a university of Pupukal team? That's yeah. my question. Uh, Pupukal team is one of the subsidiaries, our subsidiaries, as uh, like uh, we mentioned before. Uh, all. Uh, uh, state on enterprise, state on company uh, from Pupuk already uh, uh, make a holding, and then Pupuk Indonesia as a holding have a uh, subsidiaries like Kaltim, uh, Petrokimia Gresik, uh, Pupuk Indonesia, uh, Pupusri, and then uh, Pupuk Iskandar Muda in Aceh. So uh, we want to develop. Now focus, we have to prepare since now, of course, uh, the competencies in blue and green energy. So we need to, to send our, uh, to, to choose our top talent to build uh, specific competencies, technical competencies, of course, in that areas. So uh, maybe Pupukal team is the biggest uh, uh, subsidiaries already prepare for that, but still we still want to develop more uh, the number of employees to shifting uh, or to add our uh, business uh, uh, transformation. So not only in the, uh, not only chemical and uh, fertilizer. So we will move to we will add uh, energy yeah, uh, from uh, ammonia. So. This like a new DNA for us, yeah. So uh, why? So, 
we want to not only reskilling but upskilling our competencies. Yeah, so Butina, maybe a, a follow-up question to that, because probably that is also the question that we would like to uh, to ask. Mm -hmm. Is is there a plan to to develop your own university, University of uh, Pupuk Indonesia? Uh, Who I? <laughs> maybe uh, not in the sense uh, or in near. Uh, maybe Negative. maybe better we uh, make a collaboration with. Yes. Uh, yeah, not built by ourselves. Maybe better. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's good. So uh, uh, we would like to thank you again, uh, uh, Butina, for your availability. And again, our uh, invitation is still uh, open. And uh, please visit us in the near future. Thank you, Butina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And I would like to uh, invite the next speaker, who is uh, uh, quite well established in the Groningen area. Uh, who, uh, he is uh, Lars de Groot, Managing Director of Demcon Industrial Systems. He's been uh, developing various uh, technology in the North, uh, helping the various technology company in the North already since the uh, beginning of 2000s with various positions in Drachten. And today he's going to tell us about the uh, recent uh, an endeavor by Demcon towards the hydrogen technology. So, uh, Demcon, uh, Demcon, sorry. <laughs> Lars, the place is yours. Thank you very much. Sorry. 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 Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, to thank you about uh, to, to get the opportunity to talk about our uh, hydrogen projects, the uh, Waveator, in this uh, uh, in this setting. Uh, maybe you can start the the, the presentation. So the Waveator project is a, a collaborative collaboration between the, the the local university and a couple of uh, of companies uh, uh, based locally here. Uh, I'll elaborate a bit on that, but I'll start to set the set the stage a bit uh, by a few stages. Yeah, oh, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> a, a couple of sheets about uh, Demcon. Where do I point this? Ah. <laughs> so Demcon was, uh, was founded uh, uh, almost three decades ago uh, by two ambitious uh, students and the those two uh, uh, men are still our, our current two owners. They've grown up to about 1,000 engineers uh, and do uh, about a little over 100 million euros uh, turnover, 60% of the turnover we uh, we get from, from abroad. Let's see if you can go to the next. <clears throat> Nemcon is located at uh, eight uh, sites. Five of those are at university cities in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, and we have three sites uh, abroad, one in Münster in, in Germany, just across the border here, a uh, small site in Singapore, and we are starting up in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, our focus is always to be close to universities because our uh, what we do is we, we make new technology available for prototype and, uh, and, and new markets. So the, the collaboration between universities for us is, uh, is, is of key importance. We have start from early idea, all the way up to uh, production. Uh, usually, we the idea is that we start quite far ahead to to uh, uh, see with customers and universities which technology uh, available technology components are uh, are able to solve challenges in uh, in in radical new ways. <clears throat> Demcon as a company on the whole is is split into three parts. About 50-60% of our revenue is done by doing contract R&D for, for other customers who need uh, new technology and new technology platforms. Uh, that's in different different market segments. We do about 20% is production of, of mostly of systems we, uh, uh, we engineered earlier for customers and, and we tend to produce them, especially on uh, medical systems for, for quite a while afterwards. And about 20-30% of our revenue is uh, 
bringing new systems and new uh, technologies, our own uh, uh, technology to the to the market. And that's quite a big range everywhere where we see a new market opportunity. And we think we have the, uh, the, the, the key enabling technologies available within the company to address the, this new challenge. We, uh, yeah, we can start up a new company taking uh, taking that on. And one of our newest companies is Demcon Energy Systems, which is also the, the, the lead company in the, the Raviator project. So now I'll shift over to the to the main topic, the, the Waviator project. This is a local project that we uh, uh, we started up last year. Uh, and the, the, the aim is to uh, yeah to do one of the building blocks into the total chain, to, to uh, uh, make the block of the electrolyzer more cheaper and uh, uh, more flexible. And that's the, the focus. So the, the, the rest of the chain is, is being addressed by other uh, companies, but we focus on, on this specific uh, uh, challenge within this, uh, within this project. We do that with a lot of other uh, uh, companies, but I'll, I'll get to, into that a bit later on. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so see, we see an electrolyzer and also the storage afterwards as a, as a key component combining the, the green energy sources to the, the, the end markets where you where you need to take use maybe in another time uh, uh, with another frequency uh, of the, 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 the green energy that's being supplied by more flexible uh, sources like wind and, uh, and sun. So we did a, a thorough market analysis before starting up this, uh, this project. Uh, both on the technology side and also on the, the uh, have an investigation of where our competitors are. Uh, we ended up deciding that we were focusing on an alkaline solution, which is uh, more or less established technologies, where there's still a lot of engineering technology uh, challenges to be solved, but not so much science to be done uh, still, but that's that first, we think that's the best way to make a, a flexible and robust, robust uh, solution in a, a reasonably short uh, period of time. Uh, there's many other uh, uh, companies working on uh, uh, on similar solutions. So we, we did an investigation where our niche would be, where we could most competitively uh, bring our solution to the market and also be able to do it within a, a couple of years because the most of the timelines we seen today is, is talking more about many years or decades. And for us as a somewhat smaller company, that's, that's, that's too big a horizon. So we need to have a, a smaller horizon where we can invest in the solution now. Uh, of course, there are some risks involved. You might not be able to save all the energy, but if we do, we want to maybe address a, a real market within uh, uh, a couple of years. <clears throat> so we focus on the next sheet. I'll try again to click it. I'm not sure if the one on the, the top left is, uh, uh, is visible here, but there's, uh, there's a ladder of, of different opportunities where, uh, where hydrogen is, uh, uh, is used. Uh, necessary or uh, uh, unavoidable of competitive and some are already uh, addressed. So we're focusing on the three blue dots and it's also in the in the, the, the gray area below. So we think that our, our, our niche where we uh, would deliver for is uh, in uh, mobile equipment, especially off-road mobile equipment, chemical feedstock, uh, uh, where it's also uh, a rise demand and in commercial space heating, which which is a bit lower on the uh, unavoidable ladder, but we think that it's easier there to find uh, customers, a single customer who already has some electricity generation and, and wants to invest in this. So this, this, the number of stakeholders there is uh, a bit less complicated to get real projects, uh, also commercial projects on the way in a bit. <laughs> uh, so that's where, we, uh, uh, where we're focusing our uh, uh, our, our, our research on, on to make a solution for, for that niche. So given this background, uh, we uh, we then try to find a, a nice consortium of uh, knowledge carriers within the university there. We, we saw in the, in the presentation of, uh, of Professor Alavit, there's many, uh, uh, there's a lot of available knowledge. This is very, quite valuable for these kinds of solutions available here at the university, but there's also strong companies in the, uh, in the region. Who have already solved some of the uh, the challenges when you want to address that system? <clears throat> so we we formed a consortium with the companies on the uh, on the top and also on the on, on the bottom right, 
one of the main contributors is the university who brings in a lot of, uh, of science and, and, and research. But we also have some uh, companies who already have uh, previous experience. So Dauna is a uh, metal worker who also already has strong uh, experience in uh, using uh, metals for hydrogen solutions, which, which takes a lot of uh, material knowledge to, to, to make sure that your, uh, your, your, your solutions uh, stay whole also in, uh, in a, in over time. And uh, RedStack is a company also locally who uh, have also have already knowledge with uh, uh, stacks of generating elect electricity. So that's also knowledge we can use quite well in this uh, in this project. On the control part, here, basically, is also a local company who has uh, uh, power electronics and systems control knowledge that we can uh, we can use. So together with these more technical companies and and the network. Uh, Partners, the New Energy Coalition, which is one of the key players here to get the the, the hydrogen valley uh, uh, up and running, all the all the projects, and we have a, a strong first use case at the uh, Groningen Airport Elde, where they uh, have a need for for hydrogen in the future, but also locally have a big solar field, so they generate uh, uh, local they generate the excess electricity, and they they also want to use it in the in a few years. So with this uh, group of companies and uh, and the university try to solve the solution of being an electrolyzer stack for, uh, yeah, we call it medium scale, but in the numbers we heard today, it's more on the small scale size, but we aim to uh, for a, a modular system between 100 uh, uh, kilovolt up to one megavolt, uh, the size about a, a container, standard container, and we want to have a system that you can flexibly flexibility place at, at the point where there's a local uh, local supply and a local demand. So that might be big farms or uh, a, a data center or some other industrial partner who has uh, local local energy and also the local usage for it. And that's the the, the place where we uh, we aim for. Uh, one of the challenges we will need to solve is get the cost way down. Add to the cost if you don't uh, take care of those. Uh, transportation will be a bit lower if you combine a local uh, supply and a local demand, and also the uh, the facilities and tax. So the the, the middleman is cut out if you combine it uh, uh, locally. <clears throat> well, this is a picture of the airport Groningen, where our first uh, prototype will be uh, uh, located uh, next year, one year from now. Uh, the big solar field is there, and they plan to uh, to have a, a gas station uh, to uh, to supply uh, the hydrogen to maybe trucks from the from the region, but also their own ground vehicles uh, which service the the airports. That's uh, the idea is to electrify those, and so that's also a, a big big user, but also a local user. A uh, couple of years from now, there are ideas to also use uh, planes uh, who, who can can use the hydrogen. But it's a, quite a, a nice early uh, site to, to test the technology. All right, the schematic of our uh, system. <laughs> the aim is to have a modular system of, uh, of things that you can, uh, for different solutions, if you scale it up, you, you put in a, a bit more, a couple of more modules. And uh, the, the stack on the right is, uh, uh, is the, 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 the surrounding technology to make sure that your uh, your outcome will fit to the local use, because if you if there's different use, if you just want to burn the the the, the hydrogen to to get back to energy, then the the uh, the purity constraints are not so big. But if you have specific industrial uses, you might need a, a, a very high purity or some other uh, restraints, and that's something that we uh, want to take care of separately. So the idea is to have on the one side the flexibility. To have a, a good efficiency if it's fluctuating demand from from solar or, or wind, and on the other side, have in the in the uh, the setup that we put somewhere, have the flexibility to to output the 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 quality of hydrogen that's locally needed. Bit more insight, same schematic, but also the the idea with which which technology will solve in the. Uh, in the modules and which are we going to use in the, the balance of plants. So the balance of plants is where we uh, 
uh, make the connection to the to the users and and uh, that's that's something that you will always need and the, the 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 stacks should be as cheap as possible also to keep the 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 capex cost down and and they should be uh, interchangeable so if one breaks down you put in another and you you fix it uh, somewhere else to make sure that you uh, you already have a function always have a functioning system on uh, on site and that's where we in the in the stack instead uh, we also fix the, the the gas separation the electrolyte flow cooling uh, uh, and the, the the pressure issues and the purification drying cooling demineralization that's the things that we do use uh, uh, at the the, the balance plant so the, the the chunk of technology at the uh, at the end <laughs> all right so where are we now we uh we are now one year in the projects and we're uh, uh now doing a, a very small prototype with the, the the one on the right we brought along. So if anyone wants to physically see it, my colleague Remco is here who can uh, uh, talk a bit about it. It's quite small, but it's, for us it was uh, uh, yeah just to test the behavior of uh, the the electrolyzer stacks, uh, how the, the 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 bubbles form because everywhere there's a bubble you're not electrolyzing anymore. So we there's some some internal uh, 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 challenges that we needed to save and also some so, some stuff around it uh, with uh, uh, leakage material degradation and uh, and those kind of things so we made these two setups and we uh, we're now confident to have a, a, a clear technology path to uh, towards the, the prototype that we'll put on the on the airport uh, airports uh, next year <clears throat> All right, so this is our overall roadmap. The first Waviator project will take care of the first slice to, to take care of the core technology. Uh, then uh, from, the, uh, from next year, we plan to start up the new, uh, new prototype phase, a bit bigger, uh, to uh, also take care of the, the, the modularity and scale it up uh, to, to a couple of hundred uh, kilowatts. Uh, we'll uh, have a, a part of the, the growth funds that was mentioned earlier already. So the, the, the first part of Aviator was funded by uh, local money, just a local investment uh, subsidy uh, uh, program where we uh, that, that, that we could take, uh, that we could use. And this is next phase, every phase of course will be a bit more expensive. But the next phase we can, uh, we, will, we will got money for uh, uh, allotted from the, uh, from the growth fund, one of the growth fund. That's uh, that's all about an, uh, key enabling technologies, the next gen high tech, and that's uh, that we co-finance next to our own investments. Uh, that phase. <clears throat> Afterwards, we go to a beta and a series production, and then uh, in a couple of years, because we expand the market to to uh, solidify quite fast, so we we plan to have an, uh, a, a sellable system on the market in just a few years. Uh, Bit more about the first two phases. So the the the, the pilots for the aviator at the at the airport is just to take care of the core technology, tech design, the uh, uh, manifolds, the flexibility on the to to uh, on on the front side to uh, scale with uh, the demands of uh, of uh, available electricity, even when the clouds come before the sun, uh, without using too much uh, efficiency. Uh, and then the prototype five uh, phase will. Scale it up uh, uh, with the more to make sure that the more modular ideas uh, uh, work, and then we also uh, want to connect to the supplier. So in the first phase, we just test the technology, but we don't use the the, the hydrogen yet. And after the second phase, in two years, we also uh, it would be nice to also actually supply the hydrogen to uh, to a local supplier at the airport or some other uh, sites where we can uh, we can test this. All right, final uh, slides. So this is an, an example, small example, I think, but a, a good example of a, a, a local consortium using the, the, the locally available uh, technology, but also funds to, to start up a business and uh, yeah, bring, bring together some companies who have a shared vision in this. So thank you, Lars. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Thank you very much. So it's nice to, to see a, a really a technology company who try to build the uh, local ecosystems in these transitions because that is also one thing that is really needed 
for uh, the region to be able to be independent. And I think the same model can also be uh, developed in Indonesia, learning from the experience from, uh, uh, from Demcon. So I think we come to the uh, sessions where we would like to have a very short uh, uh, discussions since we have quite a busy schedule and we will have a side <laughs> visit to the labs. And uh, some people already prepared their labs for the visits. So I think we could have a, an ongoing discussion during the, the lab visit as well. But let's start a, a, a bit yep. of discussions. And Aravin, are you still here? Yes, I am. Right. So, <laughs> thank you, Aravin. So both of the uh, technologies are here. Yeah. And I would like Good. to uh, open the uh, floor for the discussions. Maybe I would like to give the floor to the audience whether there are some uh, discussions. Oh, yes, go ahead, uh, Pahagam. Okay. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, yes. yes, just a bit uh, questions. I mean, like, uh, I'm interested in the modular system, uh, which is you. In, in this case, it could be like one kilowatt until one. Yeah, sorry, 100, 100, 100 kilowatts. 100 kilowatts. Until, yeah, we hope to scale it up a bit further along uh, yeah, later, but yeah. this is where we're aiming at. Okay. Yeah. It's just um, how much funding needed if, for example, I would, we would like to put in for one kilowatt or or how much how much the 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 H2 hydrogen needed to fit that. I mean, like, <laughs> so it's more modular, like, uh, for my understanding is uh, you put the hydrogen into the modular and then uh, it could uh, produce the electricity after sometimes you need to replace the modular and how long will, will it need to replace that? And do we need to shut down the uh, power plant if we uh, uh, we replace that? Or how how could uh, we proceed on that? Because this, if, Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I was thinking it's it's similar to the the small modular for from nuclear power plant. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, some of this is being developed, so I'll, I'm 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 guessing a bit. You you forgive me, uh, but the, we aim for the, the the transition into modules that should be very quick. But but I'm sure that you have to shut the system down for for a short period of time. But this is a, a system where you you put in the electricity and get out the hydrogen. So if you, you shut it down, yeah, then you're wasting a, a, a bit of uh, a bit of electricity, which is a shame, of course. But if you can get it up and running in uh, 50 minutes or, or half an hour, then the downtime should be uh, uh, quite uh, oh. uh, quite short. <laughs> and it's also, yeah. The, 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 how much funding? Uh, I think the first project is uh, a couple of million, uh, three or so. Uh, yes. when we get about forty percent uh, is, is subsidized, and the rest is uh, invested by the by the companies involved. Uh, the yeah, the, the cost will scale up a bit further along, but we hope to get lead customers then also, who who will be able to also help fund some of the uh, the development. And of course, it also helps that the governments are thinking about the the, the users of hydrogen to to help them bring <laughs> bring it down a bit. For, uh, at least for the period of time until we get up to, uh, to a reasonable competitive price point. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I, I see that there's a question as well from uh, Emma. Yeah. And maybe you can uh, indicate whether you want to ask uh, both. I will, I will. <laughs> thanks for the time. And thanks for the nice uh, presentation as well from both of the speakers. Uh, maybe it's a little bit technical, but uh, I have two questions. So one with regards to the lifetime of electrolyzer. I haven't seen that in your slides, as well as in, in the slide of uh, Professor Arafin. Is it is it actually a concern? Uh, because I haven't seen that from your R&D yeah, it, it, uh, projection we, as we well. We're still working on that. It, it much depends on the, uh, the wear and tear of the materials. And it, it's, it's quite a hostile because you have salt water and, and a large current. So it's quite a... a a hostile environment to the uh, uh, to the metals, and also, yeah, it's a quite small molecule. So the, the also the 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 risk of, of leakage somewhere mm -hmm. in the system is also quite big. Uh, 
So that's one of the, the robustness is one of the challenges we are still uh, facing. We, we aim for at least five years okay. before replacing the module, so, but uh, Arafin, more will be better. Arafin, can you uh, uh, address this question as well? Um, well, uh, I think it's it's very important to operate these systems uh, uh, in a wise way uh, because you know um, uh, alkaline alkalizers are known to be useful in if the system operates steady state uh, and uh, when PEM alkalizers may be a bit more uh, flexible. But it's very important in the in the in the, in the near future. Well, with renewable energy um, uh, dominating in future intermittency will be a problem. And managing all this, uh, the right type of equipment and the right type of operation strategy to to um, to keep them uh, operational for um, longer years, uh, it's all uh, important knowledge lines to develop further as well. So, but, but in your experience, Aravin, uh, what will be the uh, typical uh, lifetime of the analyzer? Well, this is some. This is something. Um, with, it's it's let me just look at this way. Uh, in, in in solid oxide fuel cells, uh, several years ago, in EU, European scientific community, the target uh, lifespan was say 40, 40,000 hours. Yeah? But then as as the as the knowledge um, uh, confidence uh, in, increased, uh, maybe I think it's the Japanese scientists who took the initiative, but started setting target as hundred thousand hundred thousand hours. No, oh, no, uh, no. Arabic, I'm not asking about the price. I'm asking about the lifetime. No, hundred. Sorry, hundred thousand hours. Uh, so that was solid oh. oxide cells. Originally, there was thought about forty thousand hours, and then, um, then the target in, in Europe in uh, circles. That's what the number we used to discuss. But then uh, the, the the Japanese scientists started talking about when as the conference increased. Well, why not hundred thousand? So um, that's actually an evolving story. When systems are properly understood and engineered in the future, uh, well, tens of thousands of hours should be possible. Okay. But of course, that's where that's where we uh, electrochemical uh, system engineers, to electrochemistry, and material scientists, to control system engineers, all need to work together. <laughs> yes. Thanks for the answers. Uh, I've got a second question, if I may. Uh, this is with regards to the design of the modular stack that you are presenting. There is also economy of scale in there. I think you know that eh? yeah. going bigger will be cheaper. That's uh, typically what we do yeah, in yeah, industries. Sure. And yeah. how do you balance that out? Because I haven't seen that in your yeah, presentation that, as well. A big of a market focused choice. I think the, the, our system might not be the best solution for a gigawatt scale if you have yeah. all the the, the wind farms in, in the sea, another solution will emerge that, that will take care of that. So we are mostly the, the, the decentralized, flexible option. I'm thinking that will be a niche. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, one of the issues, one of the issues is to, to make sure that the modules are cost efficient. <laughs> so that, that will... Yeah, make, exactly. A, Indeed. a yeah. bit more well, stable. It, it has some flexibility, of course, if you go to modular. Yeah, you can, uh, because then a, you can just... Uh, yeah. And, and also on the, the uh, more. if you have a, a, a largely flexible uh, power source, having a modular approach will also make sure that you you keep a certain efficiency. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a whole a big stack and you scale it up and down, yeah, the the with the, the, the heating it, it, you need a specific temperature to to most efficiently uh, uh, yeah. operate uh, a system like this. And if you have a modular approach, you can just have a couple of modules keep running at at at, at the peak efficiency and scale down. Uh, segment by segment as the the the, the load varies. Yeah, but I can also imagine that you also still look for the future to actually scale it up. More. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I can, answer, maybe I can answer it a bit. Maybe I can answer it a bit if you like. Um, there are two things. Uh, there is economy of scale, but there is also economy of, economy of numbers. Uh, if you look at gas turbine and steam turbine power plants, you go to 100 megawatt plus, etc. Then there is sort of economy of scale. But if you look at IC engines, they are also for producing power, maybe a few kilowatt level or uh, for, for your car. And there, it's actually the economy of numbers. The smaller systems probably need to be mass produced. But one beauty with electrochemical systems, whether in electrolysis mode or fuel cell mode, is that very often, small scale systems are all as efficient as large scale systems. 
That's not the case in, 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 in uh, many large systems. For example, gas turbines, 40 megawatt, you have around, you know, 100 megawatt plus, you will have around efficiencies of 40%. But if you go to a 10 kilowatt gas turbine, the efficiency will be maybe 5% or whatsoever. So, but you don't see such differences in electrolysis and um, fuel cells. So, you, so if you downscale, one part, one reason for the economy why it could actually be better if it is upscaling it because of the efficiency improvement. But that doesn't, it's not a it's not a very important factor in electrochemical systems. So you can actually think of smaller systems which are efficient and which are also probably economically viable. And uh, the 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 uh, uh, so if it, economy of scale or economy of numbers, but I think economy of numbers with small with with smaller numbers uh, might be an, an attractive option with the electrochemical systems. So maybe that's yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you, uh, Raymond. Uh, I think I would like to uh, close the uh, the session, but uh, I would like to give uh, more time for uh, audience to learn the lab that we have here. Uh, we unfortunately do not have a possibility to visit the uh, hydro hub due to the uh, a lot of uh, issues with the security and so forth. Uh, but we would be able to visit a small scale lab of uh, Professor Arapin as well as other people. Uh, Pro Professor Facilis, are you here? I saw him uh, just now, but he has left. I hope that he's going to show us his lab uh, in the meantime. But I, I, I would like to kind of, uh, again, close the, the, the sessions of uh, this morning and let's give round of applause to the uh, speakers. And for the demonstrator from uh, Demcon, it's here. Um, I would suggest that we can take a look at that after the lab visit. Would that well, be... We have it with us, so uh, at any point in time, when there's some time, we and, can show you. And then also, due to the uh, uh, difficulty in logistics, I'm not sure whether we should lock... I mean, someone would wait here in the room. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go to the lab. Uh, Chaitanya. Oh, he's gone as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, we will return back uh, after the uh, lunchtime for those of you who joined online. Thank you. And also, warm uh, applause for Professor Brian for the
Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to this session, this afternoon session. Still part of the INTPF uh, Indonesia, the Netherlands Technology Partnership Forum 2022. So uh, in this afternoon session, there will be two uh, guest speakers that will share and enlighten us further on this topic towards uh, hydrogen economy uh, lesson from the Netherlands. Uh, before going into that, I hope you have already a good lunch uh, and good evening uh, from the people in Indonesia. Uh, I'm not sure if it's already dinner time over there, but <laughs> uh, it will be soon, I guess. Uh, and then I would like to hand over uh, this session to our uh, moderator and facilitator, uh, Mr. Rivo Octaviano. Uh, Mr. Rivo is a, a technical uh, consultant uh, at TNO of uh, Energy Transition. So, Mr. Rivo, please, uh, the floor is yours. So, I think. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rifo. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lab tour uh, that we just conducted uh, one hour ago. Maybe we have a really short time for uh, eating lunch, uh, but we would like to have now the follow-up uh, discussion for the afternoon. So it's more detailed. Uh, in the morning, uh, Carla already explained about the Dutch roadmap uh, regarding the hydrogen uh, from 2030 mm -hmm. up to 2050, that we would like to invite our next speaker, is from Gashuni, is Mr. Eddie Liklama Nayeho. So basically he has working for Gashuni quite a long time, 33 years old, it's quite really experienced. Currently he serves as a project director of Hydrogen Backbone. Mm -hmm. So he he he's an integration manager, Hydrogen Network Netherlands, involved in several projects in the development of hydrogen pipeline infrastructure and integrating this uh, with the running business. Eddie quite has uh, extensive experience as project manager of natural gas infrastructure project like LNG terminal, compressor station, and pipeline. But also, besides this project management, he has also experience as a CIO of Gas Uni uh, before. So let's see. Uh, I hope you can give uh, enhancement regarding what is a Gas Uni Roadmap uh, in the in the in this uh, coming years. Yeah, thank sure. you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. This one's forward. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for for having me. Uh, but before I start my talk, I'd like to take you back to where I was born. Mm -hmm. I was born in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and I lived in uh, in Harare. For, uh, for 15 years. And I remember when I was a little boy and when the sun came out in the, well, in the, in the summer, uh, when it started beating down on our heads, we uh, would gather up uh, our courage to go to the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Because um, one thing you should know about swimming pools in Africa, uh, they are not heated. So especially in the beginning of the summer, the water is very, very cold. So when we'd go there, we'd go with our friends and then we would line up and we would dare each other to jump in. And then we said, okay, let's go. So we'd all run to the pool together. And then there was one person who would jump in and the rest would stand and we, it would be the, the laughing stock because everybody was laughing because you were the only one in this cold pool. <laughs> but we learn, we learn from our mistakes. So we get out of the pool and then we join hands. And when we join hands, we are kind of making a contract with each other. So, and in, in making this contract and keeping our hands uh, tied together, we again run to the pool and then everybody's pulled in. So we all jump into this pool together. And this, I think, symbolizes what we're facing at the moment. Uh, because we are in a transition period, we are all facing this hydrogen pool, which we have to jump into. <laughs> and we have to have contracts in place to make this work. And Gasini, as a company, 
Next slide, please. Yeah. Is it working? Okay, thank you. So Gazian as a company is kind of in the middle. So we are the company that is, is joining, let's say, these hands of these of our partners on the on the production side and on the usage side. So we are we are connecting the connecting these two. And we have said, well, we are going to be uh, upfront in this in this game. We want to uh, invest in the hydrogen economy by investing in the pipelines upfront. But we are also saying we are not going to do this without having the contracts in place. So this is, I think, why I'm telling this this story about holding each other's hands and uh, getting getting it moved. So if you look at this network, and and Carla showed this this picture this morning, and uh, the interesting thing is is that we have a lot of parallel pipelines. So the the gray and the and the, and and the yellow are, are uh, different qualities. Yellow being uh, high quality uh, uh, gas, uh, natural gas, and gray being a low uh, or the Kronian gas quality. Uh, and now the Kronian field is closing down. So that means that a number of these pipelines are becoming available for hydrogen. So that I think is the, the good news that we are looking into at this moment. We as as as, as Gazini are in a perfect position that we have these pipelines that are being made available for uh, hydrogen transport. And another thing is also the situation of the Netherlands itself being a, a country situated in the North Sea uh, with a lot of uh, offshore uh, wind possibilities and also having a number of major harbors which you can utilize for the import of hydrogen. So this actually is kind of a unique selling position for the Netherlands where we are, uh, where we are possible to be, let's say, in the front of making this step into the hydrogen uh, economy. <laughs> So we are investing enormously in, in the development of, of uh, green energy. Uh, and as you can see on the graph, the major part of this is in, in, uh, in hydrogen. Um, but we only, we, it's not only hydrogen that we're working on. We are working on a lot of pro different projects. So this is a, a map showing all the projects that we're working on. Besides hydrogen, we're also working on uh, warm water uh, pipelines. We're working on... Uh, green uh, green gas uh, production. Uh, we're working on uh, import facilities, but also CCS, so uh, carbon capture and storage. So these are all different projects which are uh, going on at this moment, uh, and we're working on them all. Uh, so the one is, let's say, further in in development than the other, uh, but these are all the developments going on. There's one pipeline which is called uh, between uh, it's, it's completely in the south. Uh, between Dao and Yara, which is already in operation. So there we already have a pipeline which is being utilized. Okay, so with regards to the development of the, uh, the hydrogen itself, we've kind of split the, the, the industry in four pillars, uh, being transport, storage, import, and offshore. And I'll touch on these, uh, these four topics uh, as, as a process. So with the transport, as I said, we are kind of the connecting uh, party, uh, connecting uh demand and supply uh, and we have um our plan is to have the the uh, network as as which is shown uh on the top uh, right uh up and running in 2030 and it's not only let's say the netherlands but it's also the northern part of germany and yeah? because we don't we not only have uh a network in the netherlands but we also have a network in the northern part of germany which we can also utilize <laughs> So together with the Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, and uh, Carla was, uh, gave this morning a presentation, we developed, let's say, a rollout plan, how the, the, the network itself will evolve. Um, and at this moment, we are currently uh, working on a pipeline in Rotterdam area. We've already ordered the materials for that. So the construction of that will probably start sometime next year. Uh, and we're also working on a lot of uh, developments in the north of the country. Uh, working on in Ceylon, which is in the south, and in Amsterdam area. So these are the four industrial harbor areas where we will be concentrating on first, and then we will be connecting them. Uh, and we want to have this up and running around 2026 uh, period. And then we want to step further, connecting, let's say, Gemelot, which is completely in the south, which is a major demand area. But in the, in the meantime, and it's also in 26, we also have our first cross-border connections. 
uh, because in the south, we'll have cross-border connections with Belgium, and to the east, we have cross-border connections with uh, Germany. So we're also in discussion with the uh, system transport operators in Germany and Belgium to have the connections uh, up and running there on time. But obviously, we will have to talk and, and, and ensure that these connections are there. Um, and in the end, in 2030, we'll have a kind of a, a ring in which uh, hydrogen can be be, be uh, transported across the country. The network itself will have a capacity of around 10 gigawatts without compression. So the, the pressure of the network will probably be somewhere between 50 bars entry and 30 bars exit. Uh, the design pressure will be 66 bars uh, because the current pipelines are all designed for 66 bars pressure. So that, that will be, let's say, the ultimate goal where we're going for is the 66 bar uh, hydrogen uh, pressure system. <clears throat> but in the first stage, we will be limiting it to 50 bars entry, 30 bars exit without compression. Uh, we can increase the capacity of the network uh, by adding in compression uh, where necessary. And that's, I think, one of the nice things about this network. It's also going to be uh, uh, attached to the existing compressor stations. So we can easily, let's say, transform uh, tra uh, compressors that compressor state of compressors that are there to compress hydrogen obviously the technology has to be developed uh, in, in that uh, to a further let's say technical readiness level but these are these are developments that are going on at the moment so uh and in germany we're basically doing the same kind of three-phase approach and there, you, there we have a, have a, have a, a slide showing how the development in, in, in Germany will be. This is obviously the Gazuni network in Germany, uh, connecting, let's say, major industries. Uh, and you might be asking yourself, why, why, why this approach? And so our thinking was, when you're looking into developing this, this hydrogen backbone and also thinking about where the major emissions are, the major emissions are with the industries. So we said we're going to focus first in the first stage on, on, on the industries to get them connected and get them converted to hydrogen. Uh, and in, after that, so after 2030, we will be going to the domestic market, uh, maybe to households or uh, in, in the first stage, we think heavy transport. So uh, trucks or trains uh, or ships uh, running on, on hydrogen. So these developments are obviously going on simultaneously. Uh, but we do see a, a, with regards to transport and distribution, we see a differentiation between uh, industrial usage and uh, domestic usage. But this is obviously a part of the bigger plan. And the bigger plan is the plan for the hydrogen background for Europe, uh, which is going to be up and running somewhere around 2040. Uh, and as you can see in 2030, especially let's say the, the, the German, Dutch and Belgium uh, part uh, will be fully developed, uh, and other countries will come along as uh, in time as, as shown here. So this is, I think, the, the bigger plan where let's say all of Europe will be connected with uh, with the hydrogen uh, backbone. Um, and then something with regards to system integration, because obviously the the energy transition is not only about hydrogen; it's also about electricity, uh, and um, so at, at this moment, let's say with regards to electrical consumption, electrons versus molecules, there's about 80, 20 percent uh, uh, mix. So 20 percent of the energy usage within the Netherlands is electron based and 80 percent is molecule based. Currently, the electric, electrical grid in the Netherlands has a capacity of around 20 gigawatts. Uh, whereas, let's say the capacity of the gas transport network is 350 gigawatts. Uh, so if you're going to be transforming, let's say, this, 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 this energy network, this electrical network from a 20 gigawatt system, which now does 20%, and you have to get it up to 50%, uh, which is obviously one of is, is, well, is the goal, it means a major investment in electrical in, in the electrical grid. And at this moment, uh, Tenet is already investing 7 billion euros a year, let's say, and enhancing their grid, uh, whereas we are investing 1.5 billion to develop this hydrogen grid, which will be able to transport 15 gigawatts of energy in the first stage. And so we think that hydrogen will play an important role um, and it will develop as, as, it, as it continues because we don't think that the electrical grid 
will be able to demand with, uh, deal with the demand which will be out there uh, in the future. There are a lot of areas in the Netherlands, especially the industrial areas, where it's difficult to get electrical connection at this moment uh, because the, the, the capacity of the network is not sufficient to deal with this. So uh, in our opinion, the, the, the capacity of the, the, the natural gas transport grid is, is there and can be utilized to, to deal with this energy demand uh, question. So the, 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 the real question is where will it end up with regards to the split between electrons and molecules? We don't know, but obviously hydrogen will play an important role in that. So with regards to costs, and because obviously when you start off a network, uh, it's obviously a run up. And so you start off with, uh, with not a lot of contracts in place. So in the first stage, uh, the, uh, the network itself will not uh, be economical feasible. Uh, so we have, we have talks with uh, the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs. So how can we deal with this? And, and we've come up with a plan with the Economic Affairs in which 750 million euros will be uh, uh, um, set aside for 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 uh, the gas you need to to be able to deal with the losses that we'll be confronting in the first uh, years until we get this three to four gigawatts of uh, energy coming into our network. So this is basically a graph showing how this development is going and how we're dealing with this uh, with this su subsidy, which is not a capex subsidy, but as a subsidy which which will deal with let's say the losses that we are confronted with when developing uh, the, the network. With regards to the commercial prospects, this is a graph showing, let's say the expression of interest that we are, we are seeing at the moment. So how, how much entry and exit uh, uh, capacities are being uh, requested. These are expression of interest. These are not contracts. So going back to holding of hands, we are, we are on the side of the pool and we're standing next to each other. We don't have any hands holding yet. Uh, so this is this is a, a graph which you have to also understand with that in your mind, uh, because if you look at the current situation, also, the, also with the high natural gas prices, uh, you, you see a lot of companies also choosing to, to bring down their production uh, to save money, and then not saying, okay, we will pay the extra amounts for, for this higher price energy. Uh, so it, it is it is a it is a challenge also with regards to the hydrogen prices to make this step, and that's where the holding of hands, the contracts come back into place. We really need to have these contracts to to get this thing uh, get this this up and running. But looking at this graph, and you see in 2030, where we are looking probably at a, at a capacity of around uh, you know, maybe five six gigawatts. It really is promising. So it, it, it's not, let's say, that we are looking at at something that is not feasible. It really is feasible. So we believe that this will really kick off. But what once again, we do need these contracts in place to uh, to really show uh, show that we are uh, are in the right position. And then something with regards to the reuse of existing natural gas pipelines. Carla mentioned that this morning as well. The reuse of pipelines is four times cheaper than uh, building new pipelines. So that, that is, I think, a very important case, why we are reusing them. But another thing is, obviously, when you're constructing a, a new pipeline, there's a lot of burden to the environment. And you can avoid that kind of burden by reusing your, your pipelines. What you do need to do is you have to replace the valves right? because the valve stations that are currently in existing pipelines are not suitable for hydrogen. So you have to replace them, but you need a lot less. Currently, we have uh, valve stations every 10 kilometers, and you can increase that up to 80 kilometers. So you, 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 there's a lot less valve stations needed than the, the original, uh, in the original setup. So that is, I think, a, a good news. And then I've, sh I've also shown a little bit of an a, 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 a insight into cost differences between, let's say, electrical cable and uh, a gas pipeline. So this is a comparison of a pipeline which we uh, built between the Netherlands and England, which cost us, cost us around 500 million euros. It has a capacity of uh, 20 gigawatts. So that's one single pipeline connecting England. The uh, power company, Brit, Brit, uh, they built a BritNet uh, uh, pipeline cable uh, across the sea, uh, sea floor, which costs uh, a little bit more, uh, so 600 million, and has a capacity of one gigawatt. And so when you're looking into uh, investing into 
uh, energy transport networks, it makes sense to think about the differences between what can you what 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 can you do with a pipeline versus a cable, and obviously with with the conversion from elect electricity to uh, uh, hydrogen, there is a loss of of energy. Uh, so that that's something you have to take into account. Uh, but it's it's really worthwhile to to make the mathematics. And if we, especially when we're thinking about offshore, uh, when we when we're building offshore farms in the North Sea, the further the the the, the farms are away from the land, the more interesting it gets to do the electrolysis, not onshore but offshore, and get the transport of the uh, of the hydrogen in that way, or the energy in that way to the shore, because laying these cables is a very expensive. Uh, uh, Proposition, and then with regards to balancing, because this is one of the things I think one of the important parts about having a hydrogen network set up, you have to realize that uh, with uh, green energy production, it fluctuates. It fluctuates with the sun, it fluctuates with the wind, and you have to balance this out. So we have done calculations. Okay, how much capacity do we need with regards to storage facilities to take care of this imbalance in the network? And we've come up with uh, with a, a rough indication that for every gigawatt of uh, 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 of hydrogen in your network, you need one uh, cavern, and a cavern is roughly about a million cubic meters of uh, space uh, below ground in a in a salt cavern. Uh, well, that's what it's called cavern. But so you need you need let's say for this four gigawatts what we're looking into, you probably need roughly about four caverns in place to balance the network and the balancing of the network is important obviously because obviously the, the demand uh, will be more stable so you are, uh, companies want to have a stable offtake of, of hydrogen whereas the production will will fluctuate with with uh, with the wind but you can i mean this is this is this is probably one of the interesting parts of you know where we're going to because if you're looking into the fluctuation, it, you can also manage this because you can make good product, uh, predictions of, let's say, how the wind will be next week, as good as possible. You know, it, it, we're getting better in this. Uh, but So you can, uh, let's say, have more import coming or you could have more blue hydrogen production set up to, to take care of these gaps. So, you know, these are also balancing questions, but there's also balancing, balancing possibilities on the demand side. So, for instance, uh, steel production companies who are going into this DRI uh, process, uh, changing the, the way of, uh, of steel production, they can make a choice, either using hydrogen or natural gas. And so you can also balance the demand a little bit on that side. So balancing is, I think, an important uh, issue to take care of. And then uh, safety is obviously also another uh, issue. We've done some intensive research on the suitability of the steel pipelines that we have with regards to uh, usage for hydrogen. And we are very, very confident that it will, it will work. We've done some uh, investigation with regards to pressure fluctuations. So it's one of the things that, that we have to take care of is pressure fluctuations in the pipeline. Uh, with too much fluctuations, there is a, 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 a probability of, let's say, a little bit more uh embrittlement of the the material uh but we've done we've done let's say extensive research on this and we've come up with the following so with regards to the safety of the of, the, of a pipeline you can go up to let's say 0 0.25 millimeters uh, crack then you still then you're still safe within 100 years eh? so 0 0.25 millimeters crack within 100 years time you're still safe and in our research that we've come up with, we have seen that the crack uh, growth in with using hydrogen with these pressure fluctuations that we have simulated is 0 0.01. So it's a lot, lot safer than this 0 0.25. Yeah? And I think there's also a paper out there somewhere. So if you're interested, we can also share that. And other very uh, important topic is the quality of, of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, we've come up with a, a, a quality of bigger than 90%, so larger than 98% pure hydrogen. We've come up with this uh, percentage because uh, it gives blue hydrogen, let's say, a, a, a good, good starting position for, uh, for this, uh, with this percentage. Bringing it up higher would mean that you would lose a lot more product in the production of your blue hydrogen. Uh, and we need 
to kick off this this economy, I think we do need blue hydrogen to start off with. Uh, so 98% is about also about the demand. Uh, and obviously with regards to uh, the 99.999, which is absolutely necessary for fuel cell uh, usage. Uh, it's also something that is, is wanted by a lot of feedstock companies. Uh, so the discussions that we're having with feedstock companies is more about what is in the 2%, which can be eliminate, eliminated. And so quality is a, a very important topic to look in. Uh, this at this moment is not yet being fixed. So this is something that is still being uh, discussed. Uh, but we have, uh, at this moment, have kind of set up a, a standard for 98%. Just going on to storage. Uh, as I said, the storage uh, we are looking into now is probably setting up four caverns in in, uh, in uh, not so far from here, uh, roughly, I think, 30, 30 kilometers to, to the east. We have a possibility there to 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 build caverns. Actually, there's already a cavern ready ready and waiting, so it's still filled with brine. So uh, we can pump out the brine and then we can fill it with hydrogen. So um, I won't go into this too much, but we've done we've done a lot of investigation into storage at the moment. So is is the caverns are they suitable for hydrogen storage? And the answer is simply yes, they are. Uh, so this is something that we're going into. Uh, and as I said already, with regards to um, the uh, the necessity of storage is also influenced by the, the fluctuation of, uh, of wind and, uh, and solar. Right, and this is a, an overview of the pricing. So if you look at the pricing of what does it cost to store energy uh, in, in the different forms uh, versus, let's say, salt caverns and above ground uh, cylinders, you see, let's say, a, a major, major difference in, in the pricing. So I think, you know, salt caverns really have, have an important role to play. I think one of the large costs of, an, of, a, of a cavern is obviously the filling. So you need some cushion gas there, uh, which, will, which will remain in, in the cavern uh, because you also need some pressure within the cavern to, to, keep, it, uh, to keep it safe. Uh, but I think this this gives a, a nice overview of how these two the, of these areas can be compared, and also this is a comparison, let's say, with regards to electrical storage versus uh, hydrogen uh, storage uh, in caverns. So if you're looking at uh, at the power wall, uh, yeah, you need you need enormous lot of power walls uh, before you can let's say uh, get in the area of what you can do with regards to cavern. And so in a in a in a in a cavern you can. Uh, store roughly around 240 gigawatts per hour, whereas uh, yeah, in a in a mega battery, you're talking about 130 megawatts. Eh? So there's there is a ex, there's a really dimensional difference in between storage uh, of uh, of uh, of energy in these uh, in these different systems. So as I stated, uh, we are working on these caverns inside Rending. Uh, they have uh, roughly one uh, well, one million cubic meters. They're uh, the size of the Eiffel Tower gives a, gives an impression how big they are, uh, and we are currently working on utilizing the cavern that is, is that is available. So we're setting up the installation to get this uh, up and running. We want to have the first cavern available in 2026. So we've done some investigation. This is a, an overview, as an interesting one, uh, of let's say the salt layers within within Europe. Uh, so one of the interesting things of this of this graph is there's a lot of availability of salt caverns also in the North Sea. So we you can also think of having caverns uh, built there. Uh, uh, but there are areas in Europe where they don't have a lot of caverns. So that's going to be a, I think a, a challenge how how to balance the whole European network. Uh, luckily, there are also cavern possibilities in the south of the of in uh, south of Europe. So. Um, so I think that that is that is very important. With with regards to import, which you're also working on, we look we're working on the different forms of import: ammonia, liquid H2, compressed H2, and LOH, uh, LOHC. Uh, obviously, uh, differences in technology uh, development. So liquidified hydrogen is still. And a, at a, well, still has to, a lot has to happen to, to get that up uh, up and running. 
Uh, compressed hydrogen is pretty easy uh, because I think everybody understands that. Uh, and LOHC is is interesting, especially uh, we have harbors that are close to uh, urban areas. So, for instance, Amsterdam, you will not see ammonia terminal. You will typically see a LOHC. So, a LOHC terminal is more suited for uh, close by transport, uh, whilst ammonia is from far away. So this, at this moment, we're working on, on a process called ACE, which is in Rotterdam. Uh, we were working with uh, Hess International and Volpac to set up a, 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 a hydrogen uh, or ammonia terminal, which will use, be used also as a balancing facility. And then we have our offshore uh, proposition. So we are, we are wanting to build a, a hydrogen pipeline through the North Sea. Uh, connecting um, offshore wind farms, and uh, we've also uh, in the picture you can also see some islands with a tree growing on. Well, they won't have any trees growing on these islands. Uh, I think they will probably be more kind of platform based. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, these wind farms producing electricity will be uh, converting uh, the electricity to hydrogen by electrolysis offshore. Uh, and uh, and having this uh, this imported uh, by these uh, offshore pipelines. So at this moment, we are still in, in in discussion with Economic Affairs with regards to the role of Gassini in this. But we are quite confident that we also will uh, have a role in the offshore uh, transport. Uh, we also have in this in this in a, as shown in the picture connections to Norway and to the UK because we also expect that Norway will be a major producer of blue uh, blue hydrogen as they still have a lot of natural gas, and they also have uh, very suitable uh, fields where they can uh, store the, the, the CO2, which they have to capture for the blue hydrogen. And as an example, in Germany, we're also working on a project called Aquaductus, uh, which is connecting a lot of uh, wind farms uh, in, in the North Sea area of, of Germany and having those, uh, the hydrogen port uh, on shore. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going too fast. Um, an important topic uh, for the whole hydrogen economy is uh, certification. So, certification of uh, green and blue um, is 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 a basis for the development, let's say, of a trading facility. So, we at the end. So, in the first stages, you will not have a lot of trading going on. But you have to really think of this upfront. How will you make it uh, possible that you will have a trading platform in the future? Uh, and so we see a different uh, steps in the development of these uh, of these of the trading market. Uh, and we are also already doing pilots uh, with a company called High Exchange uh, to develop an, an exchange market for uh, for uh, for this hydrogen uh, trading. Uh, but as I said, certification is key and so we have to really understand uh, what is blue and what is green and I think you know an interesting topic is also uh, what happens what 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 happens with the quality of the, of the certification of this hydrogen if it is transported overseas using uh, tankers that run on uh, oil and so I mean that that also degrades the value of the hydrogen that you're transporting so this is something that you really have to think about is how do you keep the the quality of the hydrogen high? It's not only about it's it's not only about the production. It's also about the transport. Okay. So these are let's say steps that we're doing with uh, with high exchange to 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 make this uh, this trading uh, facility possible. Mm -hmm. um, so as you can see, we want to let's say kind of first set up uh, in two thousand and twenty six where you can basically do some trading. So a lot of the companies that we talk to with regards to production, they also do not really know where the hydrogen is going to. So they're saying, yeah, we want to have a trading place where we can uh, connect with, with companies that will want to buy the hydrogen from us. So trading is going to be a very important aspect of, uh, of the hydrogen. And as I said, the uh, certification process is, uh, is important. Let me go back. So uh, the certification process is important to, to distinguish between blue and, and green hydrogen. 
So that's a small shortage. We have at this moment, we have there are two certifica- certifying uh, companies in place, the CertiQ, which is the electrical certif- certification uh, uh, company, certifies green energy, and uh, Fertigas, which certifies biogas, so green gas, uh, but also will be certifying uh, hydrogen. So that's my uh, presentation. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for really interesting uh, presentation. Before I give a question from the audience uh, offline and online, I would like to maybe start a question you mentioned. Also, Carla mentioned that uh, repurposing the existing gas pipeline is basically reduced by 80% compared to building a new one. Yeah. Also, in one of your slides, also by investing in the pipe for transport comparing to the electricity cable is also 20 times more cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> Then uh, I would like to know what uh, means that on and also our wind turbine currently maybe in the located in the offshore. It's uh, in the Holland Cruise in the north, and then uh, maybe the landing point will be in the Emshaven, and then maybe in the Masplak area. Yeah. But uh, what is really nice is you also mentioned about the pipeline and the connecting the backbone. Is there any specific reason uh, how you see that uh, instead of putting? like uh, using the existing pipeline because that also can reduce 80 percent uh, maybe because the, uh, yeah yeah no, i agree so that's that i think that's a very good question eh? so when so you, you, when you're looking at this is this 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 uh, offshore pipeline we will we will use as much as possible existing pipelines yeah uh, because that makes sense i mean it is no it does not make sense to to lay down new new pipelines where you can uh, use existing pipelines. Obviously, the availability of these pipelines is 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 obviously at this moment, in any case, a big question because of increased production of natural gas on the North Sea. So a lot of these these pipelines still be utilized for for natural for gas the, transport. Yeah. But yes, obviously, when 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 these when these pipelines are available uh, for for hydrogen transport, we we will use them. And typically, you know, there's a differentiation between offshore pipelines and onshore pipelines in the pressure. So okay. offshore pipelines have typically a higher pressure range than onshore pipelines. So this is something that, that you know, it's, it's 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 not a it's not a big challenge, but it's something that you have to deal with when you're bringing on high pressure uh, offshore to, to, to onshore. But yeah, but maybe a bit follow up question means that the electrolyzer will be located near to the wind turbine instead of will be in the Groningen area yeah. or mass flood. Yeah, that's that's the idea. So you'll have offshore electrolyzers uh, based on, on, on platforms, uh, maybe even artificial islands. Uh, but personally, I think that in the first stage, it will be uh, uh, offshore platforms. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. It's really interesting. Maybe I would like to open a question from the audience in this building first. I see. Um, hello, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Lee. Thanks for the presentation. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Fajar. I'm actually the cameraman today, but uh, uh, also I'm uh, actually working at uh, Nobian. Um, so uh, I'm quite aware also about the the, the South Wending uh, South Caverns. Uh, about how you know the salt caverns can can be used as a um, yeah, as a hydrogen storage. So my question is about um, yeah the hydrogen storage itself. So you mentioned about the um, you know the the comparison of how the salt cavern is much more effective, like economically compared to uh, the the standard or the yeah the traditional uh, storage for the for the hydrogen. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, as far as I know. Um, we don't have that privilege in Indonesia, so we don't have that much, you know, salt uh, layer that can be used as a as a salt caverns. Yeah. So um, I would think, you know, the the storage, uh, if you know, in in case that we're gonna produce our own hydrogen in, in the future in Indonesia, will be much more, um, yeah, um, expensive compared to the Indonesia uh, compared to the to the salt caverns. My question is. Um, Um, let's say Indonesia want to produce uh, our own hydrogen. Mm-hmm. Like, how big is the the cost impact to to the to the hydrogen as industry? Oh, that's a that's a, that's a that's a nice question, and I think also a difficult one, difficult one to answer. 
Uh, as I said, uh, we estimate that uh, for one gigawatt transport capacity, you need uh, roughly about one cavern. So you need 100, or 1 million cubic meters of, of storage to deal with fluctuations in, in production. So, you know, it all depends on the source. And so if, if your source is, uh, is, is basically from blue hydrogen, which is a more a, a stable uh, production uh, source, you will need a lot less caverns. So this is something that you have to take into account uh, when you're doing this, these calculations. Another thing is um, uh, there's a lot of investigation going on at the moment to use depleted gas fields also as a storage facility. And in the first stage, you think, okay, you know, if you're using a depleted gas field, means that if you're putting hydrogen in, you will not be getting hydrogen out. So you will have to do something about filters. But if you have a, a, a cavern or a, a depleted gas field with the right uh, characteristics, uh, I think in a number of years, so it it, it, it really upgrades quite quickly. Uh, so that looks quite promising also as an alternative to, to caverns. Uh, and besides caverns, there are also other storage facilities, like if you used ammonia as, let's say, as a storage facility, so you have ammonia, uh, 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 terminal or, or tanks. I mean, this is also possible, but then you also have to look into increasing the efficiency of the cracking process. And because the cracking process of ammonia is um, not yet, let's say, I'd say at, at level that you could really use utilize it uh, commercially. Uh, and also a lot of work is going on, on in that area. So so increasing the, 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 the efficiency of cracking of ammonia is, is important. Uh, but also, let's say, using ammonia as a fuel is also an, is, is, is an, an interesting topic. So, meaning that if you, if, if let's say, all ammonia that we will be importing in Europe, how much of that will be really cracked into hydrogen or be used as ammonia? Uh, so, you know, those are all character, things that are playing, are playing a role in determining how much uh, capacity actually need, need as storage. Yeah. So, it's not an answer, but. Uh, yeah, hope it helps. Thank you. Uh, is there any question uh, from the audience? Okay. Now I'm going to get a difficult question. <laughs> Please. Thanks. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, well, it's well known that hydrogen is a very tiny molecule. Um, and for example, if you use a, a gas storage place to, for hydrogen, it's not the same because it's much smaller. Uh, how much is this being checked for the for the caverns, first of all? And then related to that, the other problem with hydrogen being so small is the well-known embrittlement. Mm -hmm. And my question, I know that there are a lot of study from Hassouni in that direction, but I was curious if the new pipes that you build are the same material, you don't need to disclose which, as the old one, or if you find out that if you have to build a new one, you will choose a different material from the old pipelines. That's a, that's a good question. Huh? So uh, with regards to the caverns, obviously we've done a lot of testing. Huh? So we have actually, and that, that's a nice thing about side rending. We also have a small cavern there, which is only a, a few cubic meters of size. And so it's, it's a perfect setup. We don't have to inject a lot of hydrogen to see if you can uh, seal it off. Uh, and so we've done obviously these 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 investigations as to how how tight is the is the cavern, and it is tight enough, so it's it's good. And so that that that, that I think is the the good uh, the good uh, good the good news. Um, and he's saying that we, there are already caverns in use, and so it's it's not. It's not, let's say, something that still has to be developed. There are already caverns in use for hydrogen storage, so that that's good. With regards to the steel, we have obviously different grades of steel which we've used in different years. Um, and well, let's say with regards to the choice of pipe. Eh, so when you when you're choosing which pipe will you be using for uh, the transport of hydrogen, my preference would be the newest, not because the the steel is the best, but because I have the best, let's say, uh, guarantee that these pipelines are uh, uh, are, are suited, or let's say integral. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're they're they're, they're, they're uh, in a good condition. Uh, so we will choose the newest. But if 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 let's say an old one is chosen, 
uh, we, we we can make that as suitable as well. So I, I, we don't we will not make it. Uh, we will not say we will not choose this pipeline because it's old. Mm -hmm. We will choose a new one if you have a choice because we think that that's a, that's a good that's a good thing uh, good thing to do. Uh, inspection is an important aspect in this. So inspecting the pipeline. So when when we start off, let's say refurbishing a pipeline, we'll do an inspection. So we'll use te new technology to do that. The the, the best technology there is to see if we can find the smallest cracks in the in 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 the metal that that are there, uh, and that that is something that is that is important. Um, and in saying that you have different types of pipe. So you have pipe with which have been spirally uh, welded, and you have pipes which have been longitudinally welded. And the spirally welded pipes are more difficult to inspect than the uh, longitudinally welded pipes. So there's also differentiation in between which choices you make in, in pipeline. And that has nothing to do with material, but more with regards to how a pipeline is be made. Very okay. okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have time for one more question, or is, is there any uh, one more question? Maybe I would like to close the question with uh, to relate to Indonesia because uh, in Indonesia we don't have any like uh, for existing pipeline, and you mentioned that you need to seven hundred fifty million uh, subsidy. What is the minimum gigawatt that needed in order to build a pipeline in order to be economical in the future? Wow. Well, you know, I think I think it depends on how you build your pipeline. So, for instance, if you if you're in Indonesia with a lot of islands, it could it could it could make sense not to build an onshore network but an offshore network. Uh, and building an offshore offshore network, I mean, so it's 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 you know, it's, obviously the pipes are more expensive. Uh, but the construction is, I think, maybe cheaper. But I'm guessing in this, so it, it really, it, it really depends on on where you're going to. So, and obviously, uh, the choice of diameter, uh, the choice of diameter. You should also think about the growth. Uh, so, when we when we're making the choices of diameter, I mean, the the pipelines that we are building. So, for instance, in Rotterdam, we're building a 24 inch pipeline, which is 60 centimeters big, which is not the large that we have. So the large that we have are 48. So that's one meter 40 diameter. That was a big pipeline. So we're building uh, 60 centimeter pipelines in, in Rotterdam. In the first stage, we will be using 5% of the capacity. So only a very small percentage, but it's, it's, it's suitable to grow at least until 2030. And, and, and when you're thinking about that, obviously you need to have your pipelines suited because in some areas you can only build a pipeline once. You can't do it a lot, uh, um, and and obviously uh, in our case, obviously we have in other than we have a lot of other pipelines, which will be freed up once the hydrogen economy comes, which you can then utilize for 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 uh, uh, for uh, hydrogen uh, transport. Uh, but at this moment in Rotterdam, we're building a new pipeline. So it's not answer your question because I don't I don't have the equations for that. Yeah. Sorry for that. No problem. Maybe because the condition of in the Netherlands a bit different with in Indonesia. But thank you for the answer. Yeah, yeah, it, sure. it could lead to uh, an additional thought and additional discussion. We will keep you in contact uh, with our stakeholders here. Sure. And I know that you have to leave. I have to leave. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So Sorry now I would like to invite uh, from embassy uh, or to or MC back. <laughs> So uh, on behalf of the committee, we're not going to uh, let you leave without anything. So uh, please accept uh, this gift uh, as a token of party uh, appreciation for your presentation. So uh, please, Pak Roy uh, Wahab uh, from the economy function of the Indonesian Embassy for the Kingdom of the Netherlands to give this uh, flower. Uh, bouquet of flowers okay. with a, a little souvenirs okay. with INTPF in there. So uh, I hope uh, you will remember that you're giving uh, this presentation to, uh, okay. Thank to you us much. today. Please warm uh, applause. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll get from the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. I know my wife will be very happy with you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so I will return the, the session to the moderator again. Okay.
Thank you, Andy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we do already finish our first session regarding transport. So AD already gave a really nice insight regarding the roadmap of gas uni and then also Netherlands for uh, the building the pipeline. We would like to invite our second speaker. So he will more talking about in the green hydrogen, more in the source side, I believe, and uh, how to use that for industry. So I would like to welcome Professor Paulo Carmona. He is a full professor in Catalyst and Sustainable Engineering and Technology Institute Groningen, or uh, we call it NTEC. NTEC yeah. The research interest is uh, various areas in the Catalyst with focus on green chemistry and sustainability. Topics included CO2 fixation, biomass conversion, photocatalysis, and electrocatalysis. And uh, his title today is about uh, electrocatalytic production of green hydrogen in alkaline cells. So, floor is yours. Thank you for the nice introduction. And microphone check is working. Very good. Nice to see you here. And uh, also nice to have people online. I cannot see you, but uh, uh, now. Nice to have you there and welcome to this presentation. You can see the title here. So we will focus on electrocatalysis and I will try to uh, explain you why this is extremely important uh, in the context of green hydrogen production. So in the previous presentation, very nice. We saw and we learned a lot about the infrastructure to transport in hydrogen. And if you pick up here and there, there was a question about, uh, well, we need to produce hydrogen. and the technology, as you can see, exists, but has a lot of space for improvement, and this is quite crucial. And that will be the focus of my uh, presentation. You see my name here, you see also my email, so if you have questions later on, you can contact me, also people online, if you have questions and you're curious, feel free to contact me. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be working. Right yeah, now it's working, thank you. So the context is, well, by now you're, you're hearing about hydrogen all day long and before and, and again. So most of these concepts here are known to you, but what can we do with hydrogen? Well, we saw it very clearly in the previous presentation. This one use hydrogen as energy carrier. So we can basically uh, use it to generate electricity. It can be used even in a vehicle, like in a, in a car, but it can be used also in larger, electro, uh, larger fuel cells. But you can also use it as we are using already now. Hydrogen is very largely used to react with uh, nitrogen and to produce ammonia, which is the largest used fertilizers on the planet. And uh, so it's really an important biochemical. But also to make many, and this is just an example, many of our industrial processes more sustainable. So for example, in the production of iron, uh, sorry, in uh, of steel. Uh, this is a very, very large industry in the Netherlands for sure, but also in many other parts of the world. I'm not familiar if uh, Indonesia is producing steel, but uh, in that context, uh, well, you produce, uh, you get iron oxide and you want to reduce it. And what we do nowadays is use carbon. And if you use carbon to reduce uh, iron oxide, then you get steel and CO2. So you generate a lot, a lot of CO2 emissions. If you use hydrogen, well, you will get just water. And that means that you are much less polluting. So there are many different reasons for which we want to switch towards hydrogen. And we saw some in the presentation before, and here you see uh, some more. Uh, but when we talk about hydrogen, well, it's a distinction, and well, there are many labels and colors uh, about hydrogen, but I would like to focus uh, uh, very briefly on three. The one we are talking about is the green hydrogen here. But it's not the way in which hydrogen is currently produced. The main way in which our chemical industry, our society is producing hydrogen is through methane. So we take methane, which is a fossil resource, and um, it's, it's, well, there are a lot of geopolitical issues related to uh, methane. And what we do is we react it with water and we get CO and CO2 and hydrogen. Okay? And so we get the product hydrogen, but we also generate quite a lot of CO2. So there are many issues with this. One is the generation of CO2. The other one is that we use a 
resource that is finite. So we don't have it forever. So people try to look for alternatives for the issue of the CO2. And that's what is called blue hydrogen, in which we take the CO2, and instead of emitting it in the environment, well, we store it. Well, that's fine on the short term, but it's not a long-term solution, because you will basically have still the problem of uh, methane not being renewable, and we will fill up basically covers with CO2 and that you cannot do forever. Green hydrogen is and sounds like the best perfect solution. Why? Because we don't use methane, we use water to produce it. We get hydrogen and oxygen, all great. No, no uh, environmental issue at all. So this sounds all good, but there is an important thing. Now, I'm afraid that not many of you are necessarily chemists or chemical engineers, so you might not be familiar with this quantity. It doesn't matter. If it's negative, it means that the, the reaction happens uh, by itself. If it's positive, it means that it will not. We need to provide energy, otherwise it will not go through. So this means that this beautiful reaction that we, is the one that we need to produce hydrogen will not go on unless we provide energy. And that's the electricity that you always hear in many of these presentations is we need electricity. So we can produce hydrogen using electricity or electric power uh, to drive the reaction that would, otherwise would not open, uh, happen. And we do that actually for more than 100 years. We are able to do it as a, a society. And here you see a picture. And yeah, well, even if you're not, uh, uh, there's not a date here, you can see from the picture that is not taken two weeks ago. It's uh, more than 100 years ago. And this is a, a plant, a power plant uh, that was producing hydrogen in Norway. And it's, it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and this is an image from inside. I will come back to this type of images before. So the, the technology was developed, was even put in practice, but then it was discontinued. Why was that the case? Well, very simply, because it was not cost competitive with the other one, the so-called gray, uh, gray hydrogen I just showed you before. Producing hydrogen in this way is still nowadays three to five times more expensive than producing it from methane. So if there is abundance of methane and there are no con environmental concerns, everybody at that time chose to produce hydrogen from methane. And these were discontinued and now it's used for something totally different. This, uh, the, the building I think still exists. If you Google it, you probably can find it, but I know that it's not used anymore for that. So the technology existed, but not yet at that time a, a good idea or not a practical idea or economically rentable idea. Maybe it would have been a good idea, but that's another discussion. Now, so why then the next question here, Groningen, uh, uh, it's a good place. Why there is a lot of activities in Groningen related to hydrogen? Well, you saw it uh, quite a lot in the previous presentation, so I can be uh, fast in this part. We have the largest uh, wind power uh, plants uh, out offshore, not far away from Groningen. We have all the network of uh, pipelines that are built for methane transportation that up to a certain uh, degree uh, with some modification can be used for hydrogen. So we are in a good location from many points of view. We have also research and education at different levels. So uh, yeah, we are at the university, but next door we have uh, an uh, applied science uh, uh, university uh, as well. The so-called uh, ANSYS Hall is here. Um, so the education that can be provided in the direction, and there is a facility that uh, is under construction. I would have liked today to be able to tell you, oh, it's operative tomorrow. I was in a meeting just this morning about this. It will take still a bit of time uh, because working with hydrogen, uh, while it's a very nice technology for the future, still has uh, important safety issues. So we have to make sure that everything is uh, done safely. So this facility is not yet uh, uh, operative, but it will be some... 500 meters in that direction. So very close to where we are now. And this will be a very nice facility because we'll allow basically to produce hydrogen at a scale that is not the final one, but it's also not the one that uh, you saw our labs. Well, this is a very nice, cute, tiny, but it's not what you want to do eventually. Of course, you want to be able to produce it in a large scale, but you cannot go from that tiny scale at the lab all the way to the very large one in one step. So this will be the step in between that is needed to make that possible. Connected to this project, we've been doing quite some research uh, connected to hydrogen 
uh, and that's what I will tell you in this presentation. Uh, this is stop going on. Thank you. So what is the challenge here? And that's going a bit more into the more scientifically detail, but I hope to keep it uh, broad enough that uh, everybody uh, can follow. Uh, so, well, we have the issue that I mentioned before, producing hydrogen nowadays still from water, it's relatively expensive. Now, besides building all the infrastructure, at the same time, we need the research uh, at the basic level to try to improve the efficiency of the system, because this is something that will apply any time for each single molecule of hydrogen that we produce. If we increase the efficiency on that, then the cost will become lower, and then will be attractive for everybody that wants then to produce hydrogen from water. So this is basically the current situation. And now, this is the cell potential. And even if you are not in electrochemistry, trust me, it means how much energy we have to provide to the system. So the more you move in this direction means, oh, OK, we are providing more power for getting the reaction going. And this is the current density, is basically the electricity that passes through our electrolyzers. It tells us how much hydrogen we are producing. So if at this potential, 1.8, we have this current density, 2,000 ampere per square meter, means we are producing a certain amount of hydrogen. If we were able, with the same input of energy, to move to that point there, and then to reach 8,000, what would we basically produce with the same input four times more hydrogen in the same time unit? That's basically what we want to achieve. And for doing that, that's where we need to do research to improve our electrolyzers, and particularly, and that's my domain of research, the electrocatalyst. So if we manage to achieve this, then we have a more efficient system. And then if with the same energy input, we produce four times more hydrogen, then you will see that we become cost competitive directly with the meter. Now, to understand how we do that, then we have to go back to our electrolyzer and try to understand how this works and what is the role of the electrocatalyst. So this is, uh, I don't know if you ever visited a, a real electrolyzer, but that's how one looked like. So this is a person, it's a human being, is not a, a toy or anything, so that's the real size. Uh, so you, you get, it's, it's a quite large piece of equipment. And then when you see it like that, it says, oh, damn, okay, I just see a, a huge cylinder. I understand nothing of what is going on there. So let's try to see if we can understand a bit better what it is. So we can see that it's impressive, but hmm, how does it actually work? Let's try to put this on a corner and let's, zoom in and see what is inside. And if you look inside, then you have what is called a stack of several electrochemical cells. So even, even if you don't know yet what an electrochemical cell is, you can see that there is something that is repeating many times. That's what we call a stack, okay? And then it contains these units that are the electrochemical cells. And then you say, okay, it gives me a headache still. Don't, don't show me this, I don't want that. Give me something simpler. Okay, I will give you something simpler. So this is still too complex. Let's focus on a single cell. Because if we understand this, then we understand also the concept of the stack. It's just putting many of them together and making operating together. So that's a single cell. So I just took one component here and I'm focusing and then I remove all the rest so it looks more easy to follow. And then maybe this we can manage to understand. So this is the cell and that's a, one type of cell, actually, I will come back to that in a few seconds, there are different types. And what we have here basically is water with a salt. It has a role, it's an electrolyte, uh, and it promotes actually the conductivity uh, that going through the system. And then on the one hand, we have water that is converted to hydrogen and OH that goes through. And on the other hand, we have oxygen that is produced. And these two are called the electrodes. This is the cathode, this is the membrane, and this is the anode. So these two are the electrode, cathode, and anode. And on the reduction side, the cathode, where we have water with an electron that comes through the circuit here outside and then passes here and reaches the electrode. And then we have this beautiful reaction. Water plus two electrons gives hydrogen and two OH. The OH need to move to the other side. That's essential because then we use them here to generate oxygen 
water and the two electrons that then go through the circuit. So you see that the two electrons are exchanged and then we have our reaction going on. So it's important that we have basically a circuit to exchange the electrons, a membrane or diaphragm to exchange the OH and not the hydrogen and the oxygen. That's a very important and simple things, but if they mix, they're potentially explosive. So you want to avoid that. And very important, we need the material that here promotes this and this reaction, the oxygen evolution and the hydrogen evolution. And this is the essence of what we are trying to work is. So how can we increase the efficiency of the system? Well, there are many ways. There is the design of the cell itself. There is the design of the diaphragm. But very importantly, there is the material that is at this electrode and then this electrode. And these are very important in increasing the efficiency and making this movement that I showed you before from using the same potential and achieving the iron correct. Now, before I go into the detail uh, a bit more on what we do is, well, I show you there's many ways in which you can improve that and there are many different cell designs. And this is the one I showed you now. I don't want to go into the detail of all of these, otherwise it will be, be a course on electrochemistry. That's not the purpose here, <laughs> and you will get very bored. But I just want to give you a feeling, oh, there are many, many varieties. So for example, if you ask me, I'm working on this, but there's this beautiful one, solid oxide. And then if you ask me questions, I said, oh, go to Basilis, is that he's the expert. <laughs> he knows everything. So we have different competence here at the university, and we do different things. So uh, each of them has, if I show all of them, it's basically because each of them has some plus and some cons. If there was one that was, oh, it's clearly better, we will all be working on that, and that would be it. No, it's, uh, if you want beautiful because it's different, we have different possibilities. This one, it's uh, a very uh, the most established technology. Uh, it has a number of advantages that we underline, and it can be most likely improved with this design that is very similar to the previous one, but you get rid of the water from this side and we have a slightly different uh, design at the electrode. This one is quite similar to this one as design. You see that you don't have water here, but it has a very important difference. Here we exchange an OH minus and here we exchange H plus. And this, it Im implies actually, well, that we when you write the reaction are slightly different, but also that the material that we use are different. I will come back to that. And the other technology, as I mentioned before, is the solid oxide. And the main difference is that this can operate at room temperature. You have advantages because of that. Uh, it's, of course, you don't, don't have a need input to uh, it, uh, warm up the system. But these operate at 700, 800 degrees. You have advantages also from that. So because you have, uh, for example, you can use a solid material here and transfer an oxygen, an ion here, which will never basically move through a material at low temperature. So you need the high temperature and it has many other advantages. And if you are a very good engineer, Vasilis is not me, but uh, if you are designing well the process, you can reuse the heat from other processes uh, to get this one going. So it's uh, if you are uh, smart enough, it can be a very attractive system. But today here, I will focus now a bit more on these two because are the two technologies that are close to utilization, the so-called PM and alkaline. And if I compare these two, well, you can see that there are very clear difference in the materials that we use for cathode and anode. And even if you don't know how they work and what they are, if you Google the price of these, you will very rapidly see that the alkaline has some advantages because it uses nickel, which is a, a relatively cheap metal, certainly when you compare it to platinum. And if you don't know iridium, it's worse as price. So it's uh, the, the, the biggest limitation of uh, uh, the, the uh, basic acidic, the, the PM uh, electrolytes, poly -electro, uh, polymer electrolyte membrane uh, is, or proton exchange membrane, there are two different names, is the use of these two very expensive metals. They both will operate in similar temperature, also the pressure range is not different. Current density, ah, look, this one is better. Of course, I told you before, if this one, uh, there's cheaper metals also at better current density, then we will just use that one. So you see that why there's a competition, this one has a better current density than that one. Um, and this one is, then you can see very much uh, cheaper than that one for production right now. So where we focus uh, uh, our attention is on this one, 
because the price is good, but can we increase the performance and approach the one of the PM? Uh, and so if we go back to our cell here, well, then what we can see here that uh, when we operate the cell, basically, if we check basically the thermodynamics, and if you don't know the terms, basically the energetics of the system, you see that basically we will need to apply a potential of 1.23 volt to let that reaction occur. In practice, we see that we need to apply a larger potential and we need to apply potential with this eta additional. And this is called, this related to an additional potential that we have to apply for making the reaction occur at this electrode and at the other electrode. So we divide it for oxygen evolution reaction, OER is for oxygen evolution reaction, and one for the hydrogen evolution reaction. Now, while we want to produce hydrogen, actually the one that is most uh, complex is the oxygen evolution reaction. So this is one we have to focus more our attention. So even if oxygen is not the product that is very interesting, we need that for having the overall cell to work. And this is the one that is actually more complex. And this is because actually each oxygen molecule needs uh, four electrons to be formed while the hydrogen only need involves two. And if we can do that, if we can decrease that, basically, we will have what we, going back to the graph before, with the same potential, we will achieve a larger current because we decrease this additional potential that is required otherwise. So if we have a smaller uh, over potential related to the oxygen evolution, we will have higher productivity. And this tells us why it's important to have a good electrocatalyst. Long story to get to finally tell you about the electrocatalyst. This is why it's important because an electrocatalyst, a good one, is the one that allows us to reduce this. Now, the electrocatalyst should be good in this, but it should also be stable. And for the oxygen evolution reaction in alkaline environment, one of the problems of the nickel, that is, as I told you, the standard um, material for the electrode, is that it decreases activity. That's what we see here. So here it's the current that goes through in terms of time at a certain fixed potential. So if everything was well, then we would have a very nice horizontal line. We don't, it goes down, it means that the system is deactivated. So what we try to do in our research is uh, to understand this, and this I have uh, a graph in which I try to show you. This is a, a nickel electrode, and if you look at it, you will change color. It's now about to change color, but it will not. And this occurs when it goes nickel from nickel two to nickel three plus. Now you see that it starts to change color. You see it becomes darker. And then if it goes further, you see this the current increase because we have oxygen evolution, and that's what you will see here. Now it should be seeing bubbles appearing. Yes, there's. You see all the bubbles, this is really the cell going on. So this is uh, what you saw before in the lab, but really uh, going on in practice. When they decrease again the potential, then the uh, uh, oxygen evolution stops. And then if you decrease it further again, you see that the nickel gets uh, again from nickel three plus gets reduced to nickel two and the color of the nickel wire changes again. So this is uh, just to give you a visual effect of what happens, but we try to investigate this in uh, many different ways. So for example, we try to understand if this deactivation was caused by a well-known phenomenon of uh, uh, nickel. Nickel in a very oxidative environment, like the one in which you have oxygen evolution, changes to these nickel oxyhydroxides, and these can have different structure and get misaligned uh, in this, as in the structure that you see here. And uh, we, initially we hypothesized that this uh, deactivation could be caused as this misalignment. So, we run quite long runs at uh, high currents, and then we check, we see the deactivation, and then we check XRD. XRD tells, uh, XRD tells something about the structure of the material, and this is the material before and after the test, and while it deactivated, it didn't change the structure. So we can exclude that for the, the change in uh, activity, so the deactivation is caused by a change in alignment. So then we went uh, uh, to another hypothesis and we consider the fact that, uh, well, there's been reported that uh, the formation of nickel four species, so nickel is normally nickel two, nickel three, and it has been proposed that the formation of nickel four species leads to inactivation, and that's what we see in this normal run. So you see here 
that the system has basically, in this case, you have to look at it in a different way. Here we impose the standard current and we see the potential that we need to sustain that current. And basically, if the potential goes up, it means that we have to provide more energy to keep that current. So it's a sign of deactivation. So in this case, a graph going up means deactivation. This is if we don't do anything. And then in the literature, they, people reported that this could be prevented up to a certain extent by what they call rejuvenation steps. And this means uh, changing the potential and putting a, so stopping the operation and keeping the potential at a value of 0 0.51 volt every 10 minutes, uh, for 10 minutes, every 100 minutes of electrolysis. And what we are studying now is the effect on the electrode of uh, this phenomenon. I don't know if you see the contrast, but what we see is this is the surface of the nickel wire in the beginning. So it's relatively flat. And if we don't do anything, so if we have this deactivation that we see here, basically what we see here is that the nickel electrode changes a lot. We get all these nice bumps. And uh, actually, if you work in catalysis, normally speaking, you would say, oh, this sounds great because we are increasing the surface area. So we should get uh, higher activity. But actually, we see a deactivation and we see a change uh, in the feature of the electrode. So we are trying now to correlate this phenomenon to deactivation. If we have the rejuvenation steps, so what I showed you in this image, in which basically we don't get deactivation, we also see that the surface is not affected. So we are trying to correlate with characterization uh, the two things. This is part of our results. I cannot give you all because we have some confidential ones that we are going to patent soon. So on that one, I can say nothing at all. Sorry for that. So hopefully next time uh, we will have a patent and I can tell you uh, more about this. And uh, this brings me to my conclusion, more or less, I think we are uh, on time. So, uh, well, what I want to convey here is that uh, the development of electrocatalyst is extremely important for enabling uh, uh, the production of the green hydrogen production. And while we are thinking and talking about hydrogen production, actually the tricky and uh, more complex reaction is the oxygen evolution reaction. And uh, to make that more efficient, efficient uh, well, we should... Uh, test the system under realistic conditions. I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but uh, if you check the literature, you find uh, a lot of publications uh, with people reporting at 100 million per square centimeter, and a realistic one is at least 100, if not better, 300. So it's uh, 10 or 30 or even 50 times higher current. So if you don't test under those conditions, you don't have a realistic uh, idea of what is really happening, and we are doing uh, that, we take care of that. And it's important to try to use also, uh, as I showed you in the last example, for example, the XRD or the SEM to correlate what we see basically experimentally with the characterization of the material. Eventually, and this I didn't touch upon because the, the, the facility is not yet ready, it's also important to make the step, of course, uh, to uh, different scales uh, uh, to, to prove that your technology is valid at different scales. And this is a final uh, image that uh, uh, I would like to say because in, in Honingen, Honingen has been a place with a lot of, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, gas, uh, so methane in particular, being uh, uh, extracted from underground for many years uh, with also some issues related to that. But there is a very famous uh, statue on the highway coming to Honing, at least from one direction, and with the methane molecule. Well, I do hope that one day we will have the, at least also, if not uh, instead, the hydrogen one. And that's all. I would like to thank all of you for your attention, the Hydrohub and Stefano Poli, who is the PhD that did all the work that I showed you today. Thank you, and if you have questions, thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Even though my background is not chemistry, I think I feel I can understand what you explained today. I That's, hope <laughs> then I, I achieve at least one part of the mission. Yeah, I, I hope everybody also have a, a same understanding. Before I would like to give uh, uh, people in uh, audience, I saw I have an uh, online uh, uh, question from the audience. I would like to start discussion, uh, as I know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, in order to produce one kilogram of hydrogen, you need at least nine liter or nine kilogram of uh, water. Mm -hmm. And then we know in Netherlands, uh, even the government said that we need to shower less uh, when during the dry season. I mean, it, is there any technology that uh, the electrolyzer can use also to see 
seawater, for example, or do we need to install desalination uh, to convert seawater to fresh water first? Or what is the the correct strategy here to to have the feedstock of fresh water? That's a very very good question. So uh, there are there is research also related to to use uh, seawater. It's it's challenging. It's uh, uh, usually, this is uh, anyhow we need uh, uh, water with an electrolyte, so we use uh, uh, a basic environment in this case. So you add the potassium hydroxide. Uh, Seawater would contain sodium chloride and many other species. There, is, there have been some studies. It's generally considered not bad so much for the catalyst that I what I focus, but for the membrane that is in between, and you can get deposits and and it. it generally considered to affect uh, not very positively the lifetime of the membrane. A membrane to, together with the electrocatalyst is one of the challenges in, in, in this research. Concern to the use of water, the limitation, well, depends also how you see it, because if you use hydrogen, for example, one of the possibility is to, in general, in any case, it will give back the water, because you use it then to uh, as an energy carrier, and then when you reuse it, uh, you, it get, gives water again. So in principle, this is fully circular. The location, if the, it depends if you produce hydrogen in one place and you utilize it in a very different one, then you have the transportation, of course. But the, the, in principle, it's not that you are consuming continuously water that is converted and not replenished. The whole process is circular. So that's the good news. Thank you for the answer. I would like to invite audience to have a question. Is there any? Yeah. Yeah. Just a technical question. I'm curious about the rejuvenation uh, uh, phenomena that you have shown. What is the mechanisms behind it? Why, when you relax it, and then uh, you can uh, extend it? The, what I can tell you is the following: the literature suggests that. So, normally speaking, uh, if I show this graph, you see that the nickel, you have a metal nickel wire on the surface as nickel two and nickel three. And the authors uh, that reported this claim that in this area in which you have oxygen evolution, you also have further oxidation of nickel to nickel four, and that this piece is, is inactive. So that's uh, the, 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 but you will not see a peak in this voltammetry because it would be covered under this very big one coming from oxygen evolution. That's what has been proposed in the literature. That's what we are investigating. I can tell you that I'm at least having doubts that that's really what's happening. Let's say I don't think that's uh, that's really nickel four, uh, but we are we are really investigating what the real mechanism. So it's rather complex uh, and it's uh, there is quite some debate uh, out there. Very good question for a non-specialist. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. No, I, I I know, but we have a, we have a patent uh, ongoing, so I cannot I cannot disclose uh, I cannot disclose everything. We I know more, let's say, but I don't know everything as well yet. Okay, uh, thank you. I would like to go to the our online audience. So it's from Laganta Adi. So you built a one megawatt, I think the scale that building. Yeah. That building. Yeah. How much? I mean that. In order to have an ideal condition to produce uh, hydrogen in electrolysis in the big scale, how much power must be prepared? I mean, it, uh, is, maybe you can tell something about the efficiency in the large scale. Uh, that, that's what is uh, so. The the idea is to test that. So that that uh, the new facility is uh, uh, well, you don't see it here, but it's in principle altogether one megawatt, but it's split it in uh, different components. So each electrolyzer there will be a PM. And there would be an alkaline, and which will, of them would be 250 kilowatt. When you produce it at the final scale, you would like to go all the way to one gigawatt. Uh, so there, there's still a, a, a large, a large gap. And the, the idea is to try to understand if uh, if you have losses and where you have losses precisely in changing the step. But we are not there yet. Okay, thank you. I see. Following up the I... question uh, with regard to the efficiency and this megawatt, right? We're talking about one megawatt in terms of electricity. How much in terms of hydrogen production currently with your uh, uh, investigation or research? So this is the current state of the art. Yeah. Okay. And basically, what we, but I didn't show you that because that's the confidential part. Oh, sure. yeah, but uh, we are not moving all the way here, but we are quite uh, further on this line. Okay. okay. But I cannot tell you how we do that, unfortunately, now. 
And you're looking at platinum as another catalyst or only people at the moment? Uh, well, the platinum. Uh, we we will not study platinum because that's uh, that would bring the cost so much high that it is not really what we try to do. Also, in comparison to efficiency, still not paid off. Uh, no. Well, it, it's it works. Uh, it, it's almost the only option for for this system. Uh, but for for the uh, alkaline, where you can operate with nickel, then uh, it will be very difficult that platinum is. Uh, is competitive because it's really so much more expensive that uh, that it doesn't pay back. Okay, I think I should go to the. No, it's just thank you, Paulo, for the very nice presentation. Uh, it's a little bit out of your topics, but uh, how to do with the intermittency of the renewable energy source, especially for the electrolysis electrolyzer development or the installation integrated installation uh, system in our electrolysis system that, that's not so much of topic is actually a very important thing and uh, it's uh, it was one of our initial question uh, we didn't yet address that uh, but it's really important because uh, um, it's generally considered more of a problem for uh, the 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 cathode, so the hydrogen is evolved. Now we are studying more the anode. So for the anode, based on our study, intermittence is not so much of a problem, but we didn't have time yet to investigate how this would affect the cathode, where it's known to be uh, to be more problematic. So this is certainly a part of, of studies, and I know that it's, for example, there is plans in the Netherlands to have projects exactly to address that specific point, because it's an important one, indeed. I hope that answer your question. Well, I, I didn't really. I, I told give him the solution because we don't have it yet. I told him. I told him that is. Uh, <laughs> we still have ten minutes, or okay, I would like question. Hi, Paulo. I'm Median. Uh, actually, uh, listening your presentation make me uh, confused yeah, with technical terminology, but. Uh, because I, I, I'm a bankers, actually, I, I'm a bankers. I, a banker, but try to, uh, but, but I, it, I try to explain it. But it's fine. Uh, if you have, at least if you could formulate question, then it's, uh, I mean, it means that at least something could pass on. So yeah, it's yeah. already something for me. I mean. Yeah. But thank you. I think this uh, uh, make us uh, more understand what is uh, hydrogen technology. Uh, my question is, uh, as a banker, yeah, I want to know the efficiency in investment costs because in our country actually renewables energy the cheapest one is solar panel actually mm -hmm. uh, around less than 1 million per megawatt mm -hmm. and the second one is coal coal is about 1.5 million per megawatt and the most expensive one is geothermal is maybe 6 million per megawatt uh, i want to ask about this how how, how your calculation may be for next five years, the uh, efficiency <laughs> uh, of this technology compared to other source of renewables. Uh, Thank you, Bolo. I, I, I answer, uh, in a, it, unfortunately, I cannot give, saying that I cannot give you the answer because uh, um, it's something that uh, it's very specific to for people that uh, investigate that part. It would be a, a complex technical analysis, which is, not my job. So I, we 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 know which is the the challenge related to the uh, electrocatalysis and what we have to tackle there, and we know that that's very important. But I cannot give you the numbers. I know that there would be people that can give you, but I uh, I don't have the numbers. I would probably be able to look up for that. But if I gave you an answer now, it would not be uh, something very correct. So I, I would prefer to not uh, not force it in that direction. Uh, it's. Uh, um, I do think that uh, the, the, the the expectation here is to have a bit cheaper than uh, the, from the wind, but and I, I really don't have the numbers. That are, uh, so let's say that in, in the hydrogen development the research, there are and we have many different people uh, at this university. There are people that work on the more technological aspects. That would be me. That would be Vasilis. Uh, uh, and there are people that work on the technical analysis, and there are people that work on the societal acceptance, because that's also an aspect that is important when you want to move to hydrogen economy. 
And each of them, we, we do talk to each other, but each of us has, uh, uh, let's say, background and expertise in that field. And if I try to give you an answer on that, I would go into the expertise of somebody else. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paolo, for your time. I think you cover it from technology to economic well, uh, aspect I, today. I, I think you, you, you tried, you, you got the impression that I could answer everything, but... <laughs> uh, of course, uh, your contact will be shared with uh, all people here. So we would, yeah, this is uh, an event to start uh, yeah. a kick in collaboration between Indonesia and Netherlands in the hydrogen te- uh, economy. So I would like to give, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation today. I would like to give back to, to our MC. Um, by that. Thank you. Thank you. So give a one plus to Paul. Thank you. Ah, you have one. <laughs> then I have um, you. Sorry. Then no. All right. Thank you. Test this. Good. Okay, so thanks a lot for uh, this afternoon session. Uh, I guess Eddie has left. So thanks, Paulo, uh, again for your enlightenment and all the technical details that uh, most of them I also kind of lost in between. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we get the, the 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 impression on the challenges that uh, we're going ahead. But uh, it shouldn't kind of. Uh, uh, hold us back to kind of improve and uh, go forward uh, with this hydrogen uh, ecosystem in the future. I think uh, it's one of the area that we need to have in our sustainable kind of renewables energy portfolio uh, to fill in the gaps uh, between the, the, the natural gas or the gray uh, part into the, the green part in the future. So thanks for that uh, again, uh, Paulo. And before we close, I would like to again invite you and Lars to the stage. Uh, we would like to also uh, give you a gift uh, or a, a bouquet uh, of flowers and some souvenirs as uh, on behalf of the committee uh, as uh, appreciation and thanks for your thanks. presentations and sharing. And I would invite Pahagang and Pak Ramon. <laughs> yes, to to Paul. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Please, uh, warm applause. Thank you. And, or, or, okay. <laughs> Picture. <laughs> we repeat it. <laughs> no, it's fine. Right. Okay. Another one for Lars. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, yes. Lars. So I hope you like the fit of it. Which say by in there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Documentation, okay? Okay. Yeah, it's like Swiss on me, but it's not really Swiss. On me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. you. Thank you. So after uh, such an enlightening day, uh, we are now almost at the end of our workshop today. We still have a program tomorrow to visit uh, Groningen Seaport. So we hope we can see more kind of uh, implementation in in this area there uh, directly. And then uh, now I would like to welcome Raymond Fredianza as a chairman of INTPF uh, for his... (laughs) <laughs> ah, yeah, for, for, uh, IAETB for the uh, closing uh, remarks. Yeah. I think she's a little bit nervous because we have a family connection uh, at home. So <laughs> please understand it. So uh, we are really coming to the end of this program. 
uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you, especially to our distinguished guest, really coming over from Indonesia, Pak Hageng, Pak Median, uh, Pak Glasnosta <laughs> as well. So it's a pity that we couldn't actually accommodate the other participants who are already in, who were basically already in the process of getting the visa, but realistically that we have you at least then we are happy to to have you here uh and of course uh our representative of indonesian embassy i think pak dubes is no more online so <laughs> i would like to address the the thank you uh, to you pak pa roy and of course uh, all the speakers uh, distinguished speakers paulo and lars uh, and the rest of the speakers who were with us today and at least but not least all INTPF committees and also whole participants online and offline. So uh, ladies and gentlemen again I am very happy and very honored actually to to address this closing remark at this event at this beautiful venue beautiful building I think uh, I had already a discussion with uh her name is Karen Miss Karen Foscam I think uh it is at least claimed to be the most sustainable education building in the Netherlands I think it is probably one of the most sustainable education building of the Netherlands yeah I mean if you see from outside then you can already see the solar roof so this is really using a smart design and integrated uh, sustainable solutions natural ventilation as well it's very open and i also heard that they have actually floor heating but uh, i don't know if uh, you know that uh, yeah. they have a floor heating with geothermal heating as well so then it's really showcasing a uh, very sustainable high standard sustainability uh, building uh, i would like to actually express my appreciation and thanks to university of Groningen. i think I, i will say thanks to you because the rest of the representative of the university are already already gone now uh, yes and uh, i would like to mention a little bit you see that 2021 of course but uh, this is just basically what we have already done so far without the Uh, the event of today. I'm really hopeful and I know, I believe that Mbak Desti will also make this summary for 2022. <laughs> At least I'm trying now. But the uh, INPPF, Indonesia Netherlands Technology Partnership Forum, has been really set up as a multi-year collaborative project yeah, between Indonesian Embassy uh, in The Hague, IAITB, uh, Netherlands chapter, so it's actually alumni organization of Bandung Institute of Technology uh, and also ECADIN, Energy Academy Indonesia. So IAITB, well, we have around 200, 250 of alumni living in, in the Netherlands, and I think half of them is professional. So then it also gives really a boost uh, that we can really organize this thing, not only socially gathering, but also we, we do something, we contribute to something. Eh? So uh, this year, of course, then this is also supported by University of Groningen and Groningen Support. So we are also in collaboration with Groningen Supports where we will uh, do the site visit tomorrow. Uh, INTPF itself really aims to foster and accelerate yeah, any technological partnership and implementations by becoming information information hub for stakeholders, both in, both in Indonesia and in the Netherlands. That is really the objective of it. And since the beginning of the, since the start of INTPF, back then in December 2020 and last year, we have uh, consistently chosen sustainable energy and technology as the main topic. Yeah, which uh, basically due to the relevance for both countries, yeah, for Indonesia and the Netherlands, we can really learn a lot from both countries. We can also share a lot. Uh, we started with INTPF uh, Symposium in December 2020. So you see from the left to the right, that was basically the uh, the milestones. Uh, we, we had all these programs last year, yeah? Uh, there we started really with the uh, experience-based learnings from cooperations 
and uh, collaborations already ongoing between Indonesia and, and the Netherlands. Yeah, so we 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 discussed there, we shared the challenges, the the hurdles over there, and then we also covered different topics in sustainability and sustainable uh, technologies. So I think if I remember, we started also on the second one with hydrogen. Uh, and then uh, ocean battery, ocean energy, uh, EV charging. If I can see that, then it's energy efficiency in data center. And then the last one, we also covered CO2 tax. And of course, today, what we are gathered here uh, today, uh, well, sorry, first of all, then uh, we summarize all this in this booklet. So then you, if you want to see, if you are interested to see what it is about, what has been already discussed, uh, what is the learnings, then you can go to, you can download it, or you can just basically see that in that link. And of course, today we all gathered here, having really had uh, very interesting sharings yeah, and discussion with regards to the hydrogen economy and what we could learn from its development, implementations, planning, challenges and maybe successes as well in, in the Netherlands. And these learnings could really help Indonesia to accelerate hydrogen ecosystem, uh, research development and partnership to be able to achieve one of Indonesia's roadmap and target for energy transition, uh, utilizing hydrogen in the years to come. So at least that is really our, our objective. And tomorrow, there will be a second day of the program that we will visit uh, Groningen Seaports, where then we will also see and discuss, yeah, we will see the uh, integrations of various sustainable and renewable technologies at the port and industrial sites. And there we will also be able to see and discuss cases of hydrogen projects that are already under development over there. And hopefully we can also discuss uh, the infrastructure, the hydrogen pipelines that are also uh, already in, in that area in M7. So that's uh, more or less the program of tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow as well. So uh, in the years to come, INTPF will not only cover the topic of sustainability and sustainable energy and technology, yeah, but because we chose that for last year, but for the years to come, we may also go for other relevant and emerging topics. So for instance, we can also cover then uh, circular economy, biochemicals and sustainable chemicals, biotechnology, and also environmental waste management. So this we will have to see every year together with the Indonesian embassy, of course, what is actually relevant, what is actually contextual between, between the two countries. Uh, so I'm really hopeful and confident that this collaborative technology forum uh, yeah, will highly contribute to the future potential research collaborations, long-term partnership, and maybe investment deals as well between Indonesia and the Netherlands in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my remarks, of course, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and thanks to all organizing committees of INTPF led by Mbak Desti Alcano for their great effort, persistence, and excellent teamwork. So I think we should give a warm applause to the organizing committee of today. And uh, also my sincere gratitude to all uh, collaborating and supporting partners. And last but not least, all stakeholders and speakers who have greatly contributed to this INTPF program so far. So I thank you and I wish you enjoyed the event of today. And for those of you who will join the site visit, I wish you also to, to have a, a great program tomorrow with us. So I thank you again and another applause for, for all the people who are participating here. Thank you.